Good morning, everyone. And welcome. Welcome to the, the Public Interest Law Review's annual symposium, and welcome to the University of Richmond. I'm Wendy Perdue. I'm the dean here. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you here for what looks like a just spectacular program. For those of you who are our alums, we are delighted to welcome you back. We hope you get at one of the breaks, you'll get a few minutes to walk around the building and, and uh, seek out a few of your uh, faculty and, and uh, just get a chance to reconnect. For our visitors, we are delighted to have you here as well. Our student-run journals are a tremendous source of pride for us here at the law school. The students work very hard to put together but these programs and to put together their publications um, that advance understanding of law and understanding of important issues for, for all of us here. They bring together some of the, the leading thinkers in the area. The speakers will, will um, put together um, essays and, and uh, written work to go along with their presentations. Um, and it is, is, is makes, it allows us to be sure that um, the work that happens here um, stays with us um, in, through these publications. The, the topic today is one of great importance and great focus right now, um, immigration. And the, the large crowd that we have here today is a testament that this is a subject that lots of people are interested in and want to understand various perspectives and various issues that are raised by the topic. So let me turn things over now to Alexandra Elmar, uh, Editor-in-Chief of, of the Review. Alexandra? Wait, oh, there you are. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for being here today. My name is Alexandra Elmauer, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Richmond Public Interest Law Review. We are pleased to host you today to facilitate a conversation about the state of immigration in today's society. Choosing a topic for our symposium was not particularly, particularly difficult, given that immigration is all over the news. Our goal for today is to bring you knowledge from professionals who have intimate first-hand experience with issues in immigration. Throughout the symposium today, we will be live tweeting on our Twitter page, which is UR underscore P-I-L-R, with the hashtag Pillar Immigration, and we invite you to join along in that conversation. It is now my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Shahan Mufti. Shahan Mufti is a professor of journalism here at the University of Richmond. Before he joined the university in 2012, he worked as a full-time journalist. His work has been published by Harper's Magazine, Wired, The New York Times Magazine, Bloomberg Businessweek, The Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, and other publications. His first book, The Faithful Scribe, A Story of Islam, Pakistan, Family, and War, is a work of narrative nonfiction based on his years of war reporting from Pakistan. Each year, the University of Richmond sponsors a campus-wide program called One Book, One Richmond, which is a campus-wide effort that encourages students, staff, faculty, and members of the Richmond community to read and discuss a selected book on a social justice issue. This year's One Book, One Richmond selection is The Faithful Scribe. Professor Mufti is currently developing his next book centered around the 1977 Hanafi siege of Washington, D.C., which explores the various traditions of Islam and the many communities that constitute America's Muslim population today. So now I'm going to turn over the program to Professor Mufti. Thank you, Alexandra, for that very uh, kind introduction detailed. I've done a lot, I guess. Um, and I want to thank you all uh, as well. I want to thank you, the, uh, thank the Public Interest Law Review for this invitation to speak 
And uh, I want to thank Brandon Bauer as well for guiding me through the process of putting this together. And I want to thank you all for being here this morning. Um, as a journalist, I have great respect for those involved in the legal profession uh, of all kinds. Uh, it is, after all, your hard work that uh, in the legal profession that allows uh, the news media and journalists like myself to do our job poorly uh, sometimes, I'm sorry. But you still make it possible, uh, so thank you. Especially in these times where there is, uh, um, the, in the environment that we are in right now, um, where journalism is up for debate and its role in, the, in society. Um, it is a, a re really great opportunity for me to speak to you as a group as well. I know that a lot of you are also on the front lines of the very consequential conflicts and debates and uh, decisions being made around the issue of immigration policy today. Um, and that is the subject of uh, this gathering today, and I, I am honored to be able to open things up this morning. In all honesty, I should state this out at the outset, I have a little qualification to speak on the issue of immigration with any real expertise. Uh, I myself am not an immigrant. Um, I was born in Ohio, actually. Uh, <laughs> that gives me some kind of expertise on something, but not immigration. My parents, though, were both born in Pakistan. Um, and I, have, I lived in that country as well through, um, for some part of my life. And I later did, as Alexander was saying, begin reporting from there, um, uh, from the, my parents' country, Pakistan, at a time when America was deeply involved in a war in that region. And that war would eventually go on to become America's longest war ever. And as we know, that's a war that continues to this day um, in the region that we call Afghanistan or Pakistan, uh, AFPAC. Um, the book that I wrote that might be up on the screen now is, um, was uh, based on a lot of my work as a journalist uh, in, in the region and in Pakistan. And uh, it, it, it's based on my reporting from that time. But it also, um, it, it, the book is also about the larger forces of history that shape my life story and that of my family and ancestors. Um, so I'd like to just deliver some idea, comments today about my book and the issues that I cover in my book, immigration being one of them, um, and, uh, and the process of writing this book as well. And uh, I hope to, uh, that will provide you with some perspective and hopefully some fodder for discussion uh, later on in the day when more able experts on the subject of immigration, take this stage. Um, so in the beginning of my book, uh, I address my reader directly, and I, I explain that I consider myself 100% American and 100% Pakistani. This is a perspective that um, I find many second generation citizens, uh, American citizens like myself, feel and acquire. Uh, we often speak and read languages uh, of our parents' countries. We are close enough in a temporal way to the land where we uh, many still have extensive family networks. So we feel an affinity for the land. I at least do feel an affinity for Pakistan. But America is often the place where people like myself um, also truly feel at home. It is a land uh, open to people with many different stories. And yes, it is a country of immigrants. Uh, but Pakistan is a country that has a complex relationship with the United States. It, it is, to be honest, very tricky being 100% of both. This is a country that conjures up many notions in the American mind, not all of them great. It is a place... Oh, sorry. It is a place for, of death and violence and darkness and fear. Um, and I'm sorry for this image so early in the morning, but it is a place of suicide bombings and of assassinations. And this, is a, this slide you see above is the aftermath of a suicide bombing in 2007 that I covered as a reporter. It, it took the life of almost 150 people um, at a rally, and uh, including the life of the former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto. Some of you might recall her. Um, I covered many bloody scenes like this in my parents' country as an American reporter. 
But this is also Pakistan for me. This is the country's name written in the, written in the Nastaliq script, which is borrowed from Arabic via Persian. To me, this is a, a Pakistan of mangoes in the summer, of a lush playground at home, and a game of cricket. And that's what this is. And you will see, I think I have a pointer, that very small person in the far end is me uh, with a bat. That's me playing cricket with my brother. And I used to be quite good. Uh, that was, I peaked right about there, I think. Uh, this Pakistan is home for me. Um, being in this Pakistan puts me at ease still when I go. Uh, it is a soil where I know I could grow roots if I choose to do so. But America is where I have chosen to grow my roots. Um, America is my home. In fact, uh, this uh, is a uh, uh, here's the, is this photo of my first ever home. Um, this was a, a cul-de-sac in the city of Athens, Ohio. Uh, and it was the first ever home actually that my parents bought as well in their lives. Um, so this was their first home as well. And once again, that's me. Thank you. And that's my siblings and my parents. Um, my father came, first came to the United States in 1966 as a doctoral student. Um, this is a photo of his graduation ceremony. And if you look closely, you'll see that on his right arm, uh, arm he wears an armband with a peace sign on it. He was, after all, uh, had come to this country and lived as a colored person in the United States in the 60s. And he had no choice but to become politically aware of his new surroundings. Um, it would have been close to impossible for him to come to this country in this way only years earlier, definitely not decades earlier. It was only after the 1956 Immigration Act of 1956 that America finally allowed people, immigrants from places like where my father was from, from uh, large parts of East Asia and South Asia, to come to this country. Uh, in the, after the night, for decades earlier, after in the 1920s, after the 1920s Immigration Act of 1924, um, they, they created the Asian Barred Zone. So people from East, large parts of East Asia large parts of South Asia were legally not allowed to immigrate or come to these shores in the United States. Um, so it would have been impossible for this to happen. Um, but there's a reason why my father was finally able to come in this time in the 50s and 60s, because this was the time of, a cold, of the Cold War. And it was a feverish race for global influence all over the world, which, which led America in part to consider allowing people from Asia to enter the United States and come to the United States. And uh, in order to allow, and allow especially skilled and educated uh, immigrants to come to its shores, to create an environment of goodwill in those regions, and really with the end game of, or with, with the sight on, uh, creating leverage in a war against the Soviets in that region. So it would not be a stretch to say that my father's move to the United States and my life was really, uh, he was a pawn in a global war. Uh, just a very small pawn, but his movement to the United States was in order for America to achieve some global goal. And uh, I find that an interesting kind of um, wrinkle in my life. Uh, my father eventually became a professor at Ohio University, Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, like I said, and I was born in a hospital on, near the campus grounds. Um, and I was the first member of my family to be born in the United States. Um, and I have always been, like I said, an American. My parents returned to Pakistan um, soon after, and that's an interesting story in itself, but I won't go too deep into that. Um, but for many reasons, uh, mostly personal, my family decided to, they were one year away. They ha all had green cards. I had a passport, so I was okay. But uh, they all had green cards, and they, uh, they were all set a year away. And my father was up for tenure at the university, um, but it, they decided, they had, my parents had conversations that I was not part of at that time, but they decided that they would return to Pakistan. But I did come back. I, I, I came, went back with them at that time, but I returned. I went to boarding school in the United States, and then I was in, 
I was right here in, in America uh, when uh, the events of 9-11 occurred. I was at a college campus. I was finishing up college at that time. Um, and uh, I was, yeah, I was a few hours away from ground zero when the events happened. The events of 9-11, obviously, goes without saying, affected all Americans profoundly. Uh, for Muslims in America, though, the impact was also profound. Muslims in America had never been a group that was identifiable um, before this. Muslims had been part of America for as long as there is recorded history of this continent by outsiders, though. The earliest Muslims came to America um, as traders, um, long before any European travelers landed on this continent. Then Islam came to America again on slave ships of European settlers. The settlers were often driven by notions of racial and religious superiority, and so they beat Islam out of the enslaved Africans often. So while Muslims had come to the plantations in the United States, Islam never did manage to leave the plantation when it came time. Um, in some cases, though, it was driven deep underground and left its imprint on the population. But Muslims continued to come. Like I was talking about, there, was, there, was, there have been moments in American history earlier in the 20th century, Muslims were barred from entering the country. Uh, but Muslims continued to come to the United States through all this. There are Arabs who came through the 19th century, all through the 19th century, Christians, but also Muslims. Then Muslims from European countries, Eastern Europe. Uh, Eastern Europe was under the rule of the Ottoman, Muslim Ottoman Empire. And Eastern European Muslims began to settle all over the United States, especially in the Midwest, in North Dakota, Chicago, um, in the early 20th, early 20th century. Um, especially as the Ottoman Empire was loosening its grip on that region and, and disintegrating. South Asians, like myself and uh, my family, began arriving on the shores in the early 20th, early 20th century. Um, they were um, British subjects at that time. Uh, they had been British subjects for centuries, a couple of centuries at that time. So there were all, many of these immigrants, South Asian immigrants, Muslims, were fluent in English, were passing all the literacy tests, and, and sometimes jumping ship. Um, seamen. Uh, and uh, developed uh, Bengali seamen developed uh, thriving communities in Harlem, New York, uh, for example, in the early 20th century, intermarrying with the African American and Puerto Rican populations and uh, leaving their own imprints on uh, American culture, um, even molding jazz, for example. So some music historians do believe that, that the Coltrane refrain was, in fact, uh, a law supreme and not uh, written a love supreme, but that is something that Coltrane was dabbling in at that time as well. Um, and then, of course, there's the 20th century, uh, especially following the beginning of the Cold War, and that is the time that my family comes here, when America began welcoming Muslims from all over the world to the United States. Um, and this was obviously the way, I, like I said, this was a, uh, a strategy, a tactic in the Cold War. Um, it was finally in Muslim Afghanistan that the Cold War was finally won uh, with the help of the Mujahideen, the wagers of jihad against the infidel communists. Uh, but now, with 9-11, uh, Americans began to talk about a Muslim minority in a way that they had never done so before. Muslims had come to the United States over a span of two centuries, more than two centuries, from every corner of the globe. With, uh, from every corner of the globe and settling in all parts of America. What tied this multi-ethnic, multilingual group spread across all over all, all the whole country? Often there was very little tying the Muslim American. Uh, but after 9-11, all that tied Muslims together, and this was important, was that everyone else was perceiving them as a unified group. So this multi-ethnic, multilingual minority that had very little in common suddenly became a minority group in America. Um, on September 12th, oh, I'm not clicking. Sorry. On September 12th, um, I realized that I was a Muslim American as well. I was part of this group, and uh, the way I realized this was that I received a phone call on September 12th, the morning of September 12th 
from a federal agent in the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. I was uh, on a college campus, like I said, um, and um, the phone rang. Uh, it was a double ring. That's what we used to get when it was an off-campus call. And the agent uh, uh, just wanted to know how I was. And I said, I, I'm well, thank you. How are you? Um, he asked me if I felt in any danger. Uh, and I told him that I felt fine and that I hold only felt in danger when he started speaking. Uh, <laughs> Uh, those were strange days, and uh, I did not know whether it was a prank call or a real one. I still, to this day, do not know. All I know is that there were thousands of American, uh, there were thousands of Americans uh, on my college campus. Thousands of Americans on my college campus, but I was the only American that I knew of that received such a call. Uh, foreign students, incidentally, did receive such calls. Muslims, in particular. Um, and I started to think about what had led this person, whether a real person or a prank call, to call me uh, in particular. And I realized, I decided it was my name. Um, I was Shahan Mufti. I was a Mufti. Uh, and my last name is something that I had never thought about, to be very honest, before this. It was just a name. This, in fact, is what I associated the name Mufti with uh, mostly. The man in the black jacket right there is my grandfather. Um, he, like my father, was also a teacher and in this photograph uh, taken in the early 19, in the 1920s, uh, he's seen here with some of his students and his own teacher. He was born a British subject um, and uh, even though I never met him, I can see in his attire his mannerisms and pictures like this, that he had absorbed some of the West. Uh, he's dressed not too differently than I am today, actually. Um, and I did consider wearing a cap like that today, but I thought that would be confusing, so I decided not to. But you can see that here's a man who is uh, clearly stuck between Islam and the West. Um, but the word mufti has a very specific meaning in Islam. Mufti is a professional in the Islamic Sharia court system. Uh, they are tasked with, tasked with delivering fatwas, and that's a word that some of you might recognize. A fatwa is an opinion given by a scholar of Islam on a legal matter. It could be a matter of life or death, or it could simply be what stock to invest in, or what insurance plan to take out. My ancestors, I deduce, uh, at some point in history, were delivering fatwas for a living uh, in court systems of Islamic uh, empires that stretched all the way from uh, all over Asia and Africa. Uh, and if you would give me a second, I would like to also introduce you to my other grandfather. Um, this is my maternal grandfather. His name was Ghazi. His surname was Ghazi. And if any of you recognize that word, uh, you will start to see what, where I'm getting, but um, it is sheer coincidence that the name Ghazi, surname Ghazi, has a very, also has a very strict definition and connotation in Islam. Qazis are the judges in Islamic court systems, and they are often entrusted historically with introducing legal bureaucracies to new lands brought under Muslim empires. So I am quite literally the product of Islamic law. I did not really ever realize this before this. Um, after 9-11, the US government began developing a deep interest a, in what we might call the Islamic world or the Islamic civilization in the time. This behind me is a map of the Muslim world, the current modern Muslim world, world, which in the darker colors on this map signify the modern nation states that have a majority Muslim population. Many of these, some of these countries are on the current Muslim ban attempt by the administration. And, um, and the other lighter colors are uh, countries with significant or some Muslim population. To say, obviously, that the U.S. government was unaware of these regions earlier would be misleading, obviously. Western Africa is, like I said, where many of the slaves were brought to the American continent. Kunta Kinte, uh, the main character of uh, uh, Alex Haley's roots, was a Muslim brought to the United States from Gambia. Um, 
And um, the darkest, uh, yeah, so South Asians were almost absent from the American population, but now consist uh, one of the largest race of Muslims in the country. So one of the largest ethnic groups of Muslims uh, are from this region. Where, um, here in America after 9-11, they were expected to be a minority group that was all over from this world. And they were expected to speak with one voice, but, uh, um, but spread all over the world map. Um, in this environment after 9-11, where there was a deep interest in this map, um, I began, I decided to interpret that phone call on September 12th, not as a threat and not as an intimidation. I decided to interpret that phone call as a plea for help. Uh, I decided to interpret that phone call from that federal agent as an opportunity. And in the most American spirit, I decided to make something of that phone call. So in the years following 9-11, I decided to travel to this region of the world, which is, again, this map shows India and Pakistan and uh, the regions around it. Uh, the, full, the U.S. government introduced a Fulbright, uh, a special Fulbright grant, uh, which was called the Fulbright Islamic Civilization Grant. Um, and I decided to apply for that because I figured that I would have something to offer by explaining this part of the world to my fellow Americans. Uh, and then some years later, I landed myself in Pakistan next door. Uh, so I was in India, and then I ended up in Pakistan some years later, and that is where I began reporting uh, for American newspapers as an American reporter. And here nestled between India, China, Afghanistan, and Iran, and a short distance from the Arabian Peninsula. Um, lies the country that America, many often describe as America's most challenging and complex foreign relationship. Um, and it was here that I began reporting uh, clandestine American war with Pakistan. I was, after all, 100% American and 100% Pakistani, so I figured that if anyone could make sense of this, it had to be me. The slide, uh, the slide behind me shows the arrest, this is another event that I covered, the arrest of a man named Raven, Raymond Davis, who was a CIA contractor who shot and murdered two men in the middle of the street in my parent city, Lahore. In, um, a few, this was sometime after 2010. Um, and this, is, this was in broad daylight in the middle of the day in a, a city with a population around that of New York City. Um, a third man was also killed with the runaway car that Raymond Davis tried to get away in. Davis was captured and paraded on live TV and found guilty of the murders. Um, I don't know how many of you recall this episode. Um, and then, after all of this, while this was blowing up, uh, there was, uh, through a, a loophole of Sharia law, uh, Raymond Davis was allowed to pay two million, over $2 million dollars to the families of the murdered as blood money. And he was whisked away by the American government before the news could break. And some muftis and ghazis in the Pakistani court system, I'm sure, played some magic to make that happen. But the man returned. Uh, but amidst all this uh, backstabbing and um, shadows and knives, the, the war in Pakistan is always very strange because amidst all this tension, there was also always co close cooperation between the two countries. In this slide, you can see the highest ranking Amer American military official of that time, Mike Mullen, consulting with, the Pakistan's highest, with Pakistan's highest ranking military official, Ashfaq Kiani. The two men in this photograph seem genuinely close and deep in real conversation. And this is representative of the relationship between the two countries that I consider home as well whenever they are not plotting against each other in the battlefield. But I digress a little um, because what I was also doing in Pakistan while I was reporting this war between my countries, um, I was on another mission, a secret mission from my editors at the newspaper. The events of 9-11 and the realizations of being Muslim American and being a Muslim had not left me. It was the moment when I realized that I acquired, I had that identity. So I began to search for my own roots in Pakistan as well. I wanted to know the meaning of the name Mufti. This up here is how my name Mufti is written in the Nastaliq script. 
I recognize my name written like this, and interestingly, it has very different connotations. It brings very different images to my mind. Uh, I also wanted to know what Ghazi meant. That is my maternal grand, uh, my maternal surname written in Nastaliq script. I wanted to know how I connected to Islam. That is Islam. I found one clue to the, in this search that I'd just like to share with you and then leave it at that. Um, this was in my maternal grandfather's uh, materials that he left after he, he passed away uh, in 2006. And, I, um, and this was what I found in some of his belongings that were left over. It is a family tree uh, that traces my lineage uh, 43 generations back. And I was surprised to see this is a closer look at this family tree. But as you can see, it moves through many generations. And right at the top of this family tree, my name connected to these four names right, listed right here. This is a family tree written in multiple languages, interestingly, interestingly Arabic, Urdu, and Persian. And the family tree is specifically connected to this name right here. The name in the middle here is, it says, uh, Muhammad, uh, the prophet of God. And the name right here says Umar. Um, and Umar was, the, and that's where my family tree was connecting to through 43 generations. Umar was uh, the second caliph of Islam. He took the reins of the very nascent Islamic empire after a few years after Muhammad died. Uh, the prophet of Islam died. Um, And right here in this family tree, uh, which uh, is a fascinating document, and I don't know, cannot vouch for how much of it is true, but uh, it was a, an interesting moment for me to see that actually my relationship with Islam that I had never considered actually uh, leads with my blood being connected, mixed in with the Muhammad's inner circle at the very birth of Islam. What I found that was even more remarkable, perhaps, uh, sorry, was this passage at the bottom. Um, this was the story of the family tree, written very briefly by the author of the family tree. And it was an extraordinary, incredible tale of how my family's bloodlines came to be connected with that of Muhammad's. And in this story, or this told the story of a saintly man who lived uh, who is descended from Muhammad and who lived in Baghdad, Iraq, in the 14th century. And he was a denizen of Baghdad when a Mongol uh, invader, Timur, Tamerlane, also known as, uh, invaded the Middle East and was in the process of creating his empire all over Asia. And this saintly uh, descendant of Muhammad was approached by this intimidating emperor. And he was told to pack up his stuff and come to Delhi with the emperor. That is where Timur, the Mongol, was going to invade next, the lands of the Indus. And he needed a saintly looking person with him for some reason. And so he was told to pack up and move. And uh, this saint brought his three sons with him and each of them were appointed Qazis of major towns along the Indus when the Timur uh, created his empire in that region. And that, I found out in brief, was how the Qazis in my family, my ancestors, believed themselves to be directly descended from the Prophet's inner circle. The Qazis, in other words, I found out, were immigrants to the country that is Pakistan today, from Iraq. Um, it was an interesting realization for me that they were immigrants before in my family. Um, but what I found a little more, even more fascinating than that perhaps was uh, I was became cu very curious about who wrote this family tree. It was clearly written in the 20th century. It was clearly written by a person for some reason. And so I began digging and I started traveling around country meeting, uh, the, the Pakistan 
uh, trying to find family members in the family tree who might have some clue to who wrote this family tree. I eventually did find someone who had a personal diary of the author of that document of the family tree. Um, and I discovered that that man, the author of the family tree, himself was a man torn between East and West. While he was conducting this research for the family tree, his oldest son in the family uh, was serving in the British Army during World War I. Um, the man was writing this uh, family tree, connecting his bloodline to the nascent Islamic, well, to the birth of Islam, at a time when his son was serving the Western civilization and the British in their army, fighting on the front lines. This man was also a man stuck between Islam and the West. And perhaps this story, in writing this story of his family, uh, he was trying to find a home. Uh, because after all, uh, I believe that really all that any of us have in the end, despite of how we move around, is a story of how we got to where we got. And there is very, to me, this movement of people that is, in, that is something that my parents undertook, that I have undertook, and that my ancestors were undertaking demonstrated to me that the movement of people around the map is not something that's just driven by policy. It's not just something driven by governments today. The movement of people across lands is something that is driven by something much more deeper and personal often. It is decisions made by people about their children. It is decisions made about people about what is the right thing to do. It is decisions made by people about who they feel they are and where they really belong. And sometimes it is decisions made by an invading emperor who decides to drag you along in some direction. I want to finish this uh, with just a small, uh, um, uh, well, just uh, some news that uh, my, uh, my wife and I actually welcomed our, our son uh, into the world uh, some months ago. And uh, he is, he's a lovely kid. He woke me up at three in the morning today, and I'm not kidding you. Uh, and it was, it took a while to get back to sleep. But anyway, the point is that uh, this child, um, this lovely child, uh, his grandparents, some of them you saw, my father, um, his uh, grandmother is also, she didn't see a photo of her, but it's in the book. Um, and his other two grandparents are, one is, uh, uh, from, is a Japanese national, uh, my wife's father, and his other grandmother is a Welsh, she's British. And uh, my son is American, um, and he has come into this world, and uh, I feel like he's one of the most American kids I know already, even though he doesn't say much yet. But, uh, but uh, to me, that I, I don't know what, what he will grow up, what, what direction he will grow up to be, but to me, he's, he is truly an American child. And, uh, and that is what I, I think that, that perhaps it was that dream of having someone like this in my life that, that led me to grow roots in this country because this is a place that allows something like this and celebrates it. So thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Is there, should we have questions or are we good? We have time for, I, I'm told we have time for questions if there are any. If there are not, that is fine as well. No, thank you very much, thank you. <laughs> Jason Cade is an associate professor at the University of Georgia School of Law, where he teaches immigration law and directs the Community Health Law Partnership Clinic, which provides holistic legal services to low-income residents in the Athens area through partnerships with community health providers. Professor Cade's recent scholarship explores the intersection of immigration enforcement and criminal law, the role of prosecutorial discretion in the modern immigration system, and judicial review of deportation procedures. 
Prior to entering academia, Professor Cade represented non-citizens in a wide range of immigration proceedings and family court matters while working in both small firm and nonprofit settings. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jason Cade. Thank you. Okay, thanks. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I want to thank the University of Richmond Public Interest Law Review for hosting this and for inviting me, and also to um, Brandon Bowers for um, bringing me on board, as well as um, the editor in chief, Ellie Almauer. Almauer. Um, I'm excited to be here and be part of this conversation. And, and uh, looking through the, the program, um, one thing that, that really stands out is, that, is how heavy the program is on practitioners um, presenting today, um, which I think is very, very appropriate um, in, uh, when, you, when you want to have a conversation about immigration law. Immigration law um, is an area where details matter. So uh, it's extremely highly technical. It's a very bureaucratic process. If you don't have on-the-ground experience, it's pretty hard to understand what's going on in the immigration field. Um, it's a field where stories matter quite a lot. Um, these, are, these are real lives and real communities and real families um, with a great deal at stake. And so if you don't um, have interaction with, with uh, those communities and with immigrants, then I think it's hard to tell those stories. Um, and and uh, immigration practitioners, in my view, are among the most uh, passionate and creative and resilient attorneys um, practicing. So I think we'll have a lot to learn from the rest of the panels today. So speaking of stories, I'm going to start with one. Um, this is a picture of Jeanette Vizguera. She uh, is an undocumented um, non-citizen from Mexico. She entered the United States without authorization um, in 1997, so 20 years ago. Since that time, she's um, lived a, a, as productive a life as an unauthorized person can in the United States. She has three United, United States citizen children, um, no, no serious criminal record. She had a, a traffic stop that eventually led to a removal order in 2011. Uh, she was able to obtain stays of removal um, from the Department of Homeland Security under the Obama administration that allowed her to continue to reside in the United States on a temporary basis. Um, and she also uh, was the victim of a serious crime, and she was able to provide assistance to the law enforcement who were investigating that crime um, which qualified her for something that's called a U visa or a U status. And so she has a pending application for this U visa. Uh, in February, on February 15th, 2017, less than one month um, after uh, Donald Trump took office and uh, the, his, uh, you know, instituted a new um, Department of Homeland Security, they denied her request for stay and indicated she would be removed immediately. Um, despite, of course, what I've already said about two decades of productive residence and the, the three, the, you know, the destruction of um, or uprooting of her family that includes United States citizen children, um, and this pending pathway to lawful status through the U visa. Her church in Denver immediately offered her sanctuary, and um, she went into physical shelter within the church um, where she stayed for um, three months. And during that time, negotiations on her behalf continued. Um, and they eventually, ICE, uh, the, the enforcement agency of, of the Department of Security, ICE, capitulated and agreed to um, give her a stay until March of 2019, um, which would allow her U visa application to um, process and be adjudicated. Because there's a, a, a very tight quota for the number of U visas that can be awarded each year, there's now a tremendous backlog. And so when you file a U visa application, it takes four or five years before it actually gets adjudicated. Um, so she is one of Time's 100 most influential persons of the year this year. Um, how do we think about this story and what happened? Was uh, ICE acting legitimately? when it denied her request for a stay of removal? 
Was the church acting legitimately when um, it took her in and offered physical sanctuary to, to shield her from removal? And is the ultimate outcome here the right one, whatever that means? So I'm going to um, rewind the tape a little bit. Just, uh, where do I aim this? Okay, moment of panic, now I've made it. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about of, of background, the, the, the statutory background here, and it, it, um, I'm going to try not to get too bogged down in the details, but again, the details do sort of matter. So um, in the 1990s, and particularly in 1996, there were a lot of changes to the immigration law, to the immigration code. Um, Congress really radically restructured what the immigration code looked like um, in that time, particularly with respect to immigration enforcement and, and deportation. It did that through mostly through these two very large omnibus bills that were passed in 1996. That were one of them was a, a budget act, and the other one was um, an anti-terrorism act. And uh, there were also some important changes a little bit earlier in 1990. To uh, um, sort of. Okay, this is this is not the this is the this is the PDF version um, that was on my flash drive, but not the PowerPoint version. So I don't have my exploding animations and that sort of thing. But um, just kidding, I, I don't have exploding animations. Um, so so, but here's the upshot: uh, Congress created a very very harsh and rigid statutory code. Um, it it made all unlawful presence a deportable offense, which had not been true before. Um, it barred most paths to lawful status for anyone who was what immigration practitioners call an iwi, means they entered the United States without inspection. Um, so even if you have a pathway to lawful status, for example, you, you married a U.S. citizen or something like that, if you entered the country without inspection, in most cases, um, you cannot adjust status inside the country. You have to first leave the country. And the problem with that is that once you do that, it triggers what's known as the 10-year bar. So if you have at least one year of unlawful presence inside the United States and then you leave, you can't come back for 10 years even if you have a lawful presence. That's, that's the 10-year bar. Um, the, the types of criminal offenses that could lead to deportation, including mandatory detention, were, uh, deportation, were greatly expanded to include even what most people would consider very minor offenses that states barely punish under state law. Um, at the same time that the, the code became sort of broader and more rigid at the front end, Congress also restricted the back end authority of immigration judges to exercise equitable discretion. So for most of the 20th century, um, judges were able to, even when a person was deportable, look at their individual circumstances and say, yes, you're deportable, or yes, you have this criminal offense that makes you deportable, but on the other hand, you've um, been a very productive member of society, and you've got these children that, who would be really harmed by your removal, and they could balance things out and decide whether deportation should be set aside um, for humanitarian or equitable reasons. Um, that, was, that was largely um, constricted, nearly, nearly eliminated. So, if you are a um, person who is undocumented, you're not, a, or you're not a lawful permanent resident, um, and you're seeking that kind of equitable adjudication, you can only get it in really, really extreme ex um, uh, uh, situations. You have to have at least 10 years of um, continuous presence in the United States, no disqualifying criminal activity, and also have to be able to prove that it would cause, uh, quote, exceptional and extremely unusual hardship to a qualifying relative, which would be a U.S. citizen um, or LPR immediate family member. Uh, besides that, the only other path, the only other humanitarian paths um, for uh, the unauthorized population in the United States are um, really if you're a victim of trafficking or if you're a victim of serious crime um, or if you're a juvenile who's the, been the victim of uh, abuse or neglect. Uh, at the same time, um, 
mandatory and discretionary detention was expanded um, tremendously so that many people now, when they want to fight removal proceedings, have to do so from the confines of a detention facility, often um, very far from where their um, community or resources are because they can be shipped anywhere in the country. Um, and Congress increased, created and increased um, the possibility of these so-called fast track removal mechanisms. Um, these, are, these are for various categories of, of persons, um, either because of their immigration status or prior immigration violations or um, criminal uh, history that they might have. They can be put into what are, what are really summary procedures so they don't see an immigration judge at all. Um, and this, the use of these has grown tremendously. In fact, it, it accounts for something like 83% of all removals are done through these summary procedures now. So what's the upshot? The upshot is that mil many millions of people who live here um, and who think of this country as their home are now subject to um, what are pretty undeniably life-altering penalties, sometimes life-destroying penalties. Um, and that includes lawful permanent residents who might have criminal history or immigration violations, even if th those violations are fairly minor and very old, um, as well as um, the 11 million unauthorized persons living in the country. Um, obviously, these consequences sometimes extend far beyond the in individual um, they, because they usually involve the destruction of a family unit in some way, separation from a spouse, separation from children, um, and a variety of indirect and direct economic losses. Um, in the Supreme Court's words, deportation can result in the loss of all that makes life worth living. However, the constriction of back-end equitable discretion does not necessarily mean that you remove all conditions of fairness and proportionality, all consideration of form, fairness and proportionality from a system. Um, much like squeezing a balloon, when you constrict back-end adjudicatory discretion, sometimes what that means is that it just shifts equitable discretion to other parts of the system. So um, there has always been a gap between what's called the law in the books and law in action um, due to enforcement priorities, due to resource constraints, due to political will, constitutional limitations, and so on. And lawmakers know this reality, um, particularly in areas where restrictions have very high political salience. So the incentives um, in certain areas of the law are to increase severity of the law um, and rely on enforcers to temper the law and to refine the law through its on-the-ground implementation. Um, criminal law pre uh, presents you know, the, the, probably the, the main example of this. Prosecutors are considered to be the systems, and police are considered to be the system's normative gatekeepers. So they're deciding at the front end who should be prosecuted, who should be arrested, who should be charged, who should be prosecuted. They essentially are, are exercising equitable discretion um, at a different point in the process. <clears throat> so um, this is also true in, in um, arguably true in the area of immigration enforcement, um, that there has been an equitable delegation to um, front-end adjudicators. Um, we can at least um, plausibly assume that there's an expectation of less than full enforcement for a number of reasons. Um, first, we have these conditions of very, very rigid, severe rules um, with very harsh consequences um, and little room for play in the joints at the back end. Um, we also, though, have a, a very long history of under-enforcement in the immigration field. So a hundred years, really, of reliance on, on cheap labor, primarily from Mexican um, migrants um, coming in and out of, out of the United States. Um, we have a, 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 the size of the pool of potential targets. Um, hello up there, I just noticed you guys. Um, the size of the pool of potential targets um, in the United States is um, uh, over 11 million, so they're estimated 11 million unauthorized persons in the United States. 
um, plus hundreds of thousands of more who are lawfully present but might be deportable on the basis of civil or criminal uh, violations. And we've had, e even though there have been large increases in funding um, for the enforcement agencies in recent years, those have not been commensurate with the size of that pool. Um, in fact, the uh, enforcement budget thus far has allowed for the removal of about 400,000 persons from the United States max, and that includes border enforcement and those summary procedures that I mentioned earlier. At the same time, um, any system that delivers consequences of this severity, this, this degree of severity, needs some kind of play in the joints to recognize justice and proportionality. Um, the proportionality you know, means that um, there has to be a fit between the, the gravity of the offense tempered by any mitigating circumstances and the severity of the sanction. And more than that even, the, the immigration system does not only consist of enforcement provisions. Even though they are narrow, there are these other provisions that allow in certain circumstances for people to adjust their status through those, um, through those ways that remained. So um, the argument is that even though there is no universal agreement about when, a, when deportation is going to be a proportional individual case, someone in the system should be considering the facts of an individual's case as it comes before them um, and deciding whether in this particular case removal would be appropriate. At some point, and for some people, the consequences will outweigh their infractions. Why am I so bad at this? Oops. Okay. So, um, the Supreme Court has come to grips recently with this new um, reality of enforcement-based equity. There is, um, in fact, I, I've written a whole article about this and I'm just gonna summarize a little bit of it today. Um, the potential for disproportional and unjust results has motivated um, quite a lot of the Supreme Court's immigration jurisprudence over the last 15 years. So I'm gonna um, highlight just a few of those cases now. Um, this first one is Arizona versus United States, and this concerned Arizona's, a challenge to Arizona's state level um, arm of the, immigration, the federal immigration enforcement system. Um, <clears throat> The, in a, an opinion written by Justice Kennedy, um, the court noted that a principal feature of the removal system is the broad discretion exercised by removal officials. Um, and then it went on to, um, uh, to, to, to state these things that I have on the slide. Federal officials, as an initial matter, must decide whether it makes sense to pursue removal at all. Discretion in the enforcement of immigration law embraces immediate human concerns. Unauthorized workers trying to support their families, for example, likely pose less danger than alien smugglers or aliens who commit serious crime. And skipping out to the bottom, returning an alien to his own country may be deemed inappropriate even where he has committed a removable offense or fails to meet the criteria for admission. So what's the court saying? recognizing that not all deportable non-citizens are similarly situated. And it's endorsing this idea that enforcers should weigh, quote, immediate human concerns, even where formal code law mandates removal. Uh, applying these principles to the challenge laws um, in the case, the court found that Arizona's state level enforcement laws were preempted by federal law, um, despite the fact that they, they virtually mirrored federal law provisions. They, were, they did, did not um, um, punish conduct different than what the federal government um, would, would punish through Congress's laws. Um, and the reason they did that, the court said, was to protect federal authority to exercise equitable discretion in appropriate cases. 
Another major touchstone um, is Padilla v. Kentucky. This is a case um, in which the court recognized that the Sixth Amendment requires uh, that non-citizen defendants be um, given accurate advice about the immigration consequences of their convictions before they take a guilty plea. So the court went through those changes that I summarized earlier in pretty great detail, um, noting that immigration reforms over time have expanded the class of deportable offenses and limited the authority of judges to alleviate the harsh consequences of deportation, deportation and so that the drastic measure of de deportation is now virtually inevitable for a vast number of non-citizens who are convicted of crimes. Now, most relevantly for purposes of my present talk, the court also said, um, or expressed this idea, that it, this, this hope, um, that counsel would be able to plea bargain creatively with the prosecutor in order to craft a conviction and sentence that reduce the likelihood of deportation as by avoiding a conviction for an offense that automatically triggers the removal consequence. So the court here is endorsing and also creating a structure for sub-federal actors in the criminal justice system to take the inflexibility and harshness of deportation law into account and then to make adjustments accordingly in the charging and plea bargaining and sentencing um, so as to avoid disproportionate consequences. Now, um, there's a whole series of other cases that are, that are known as the, the categorical approach cases, um, which I have uh, some of the main ones listed on this slide. In essence, these cases were the um, situations where the court rejected the federal government's approach to interpret the immigration code even more expansively um, to, to, to capture, um, you, you, they typically involved minor um, cases involving fairly minor drug offenses um, that the government was trying to allege were aggravated felonies. Um, which would carry the greatest um, immigration consequences. So the court uh, require, mostly has rejected those efforts by requiring a, what's called a strict categorical match between the elements of the penal offense um, and the, immigration, the relevant immigration statutory provision. <clears throat> what I think is interesting about them is that they work hand in glove with Padilla, the case I just mentioned, because they reinforce the ability of sub-federal actors to consider the downstream proportionality consequences of a conviction um, and make adjustments that will constrain that rigid and severe code law. Um, Justice Ginsburg in the, the Mullooly case recognized this explicitly. This is a quote um, from her. She's, she said that one of the, the virtues of the categorical uh, approach cases is that non-citizens can enter so-called, quote, safe harbor guilty pleas that will preserve narrow possibilities for equitable relief in immigration court, or that sometimes avoid immigration sanctions altogether. And by the way, these are not close, these were, none of these were close cases. These are mostly decisions in which the, the court split seven to two. So um, they don't even fall along, uh, you know, what might be considered partisan lines. Okay, so that's the, um, some of the landscape. Now, how has the executive approached um, this, idea of enforcement-based equity. And it really began in earnest around the year 2000 under the George W. Bush administration um, after the agency, then called the INS, started enforcing the new code. This, the stories um, were hitting media right and left about how, how cruel, cruel the results were. And um, soon after that, the, a fairly large contingent of both Republicans and Democrats who had voted for those changes to the code wrote a letter to the agency um, saying, what are you doing? We expected you to exercise discretion. How come you're not going after the serious offenders and instead you're um, deporting these lawful permanent resident mothers who 20 years ago had a turnstile jumping conviction? So after that, the agency started to study the issue. They, uh, uh, the, act the commissioner at that time, um, whose, na whose name was Doris Messner, issued five or f 15, um, issued a um, guidance document that became the, kind of the gold standard for prosecutorial discretion in immigration enforcement. Um, 
And so there were solid beginnings um, at that time. Under um, Barack Obama's administration, there was quite a lot of expansion of this idea of prosecutorial discretion um, in immigration law. So when it became clear a few years into uh, President Obama's first term that Congress was not going to be able to pass any kind of um, immigration reform, uh, the agency started to uh, do a nationwide push through trainings and numerous do guidance documents to get its agents to exercise discretion in a more systematic way. Um, those, were, those were pretty effective, although um, they were more effective in, in some places than others. Um, and then starting in uh, 2012, um, with the, 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 the agency started to experiment with this idea of a more categorical equitable discretion, um, most notably and successfully through the Deferred um, Adjudication, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program known as DACA, which I think you're going to hear more about in another um, uh, panel or, or speaker later today. <clears throat> now we're going to move to the present time um, of uh, President Donald Trump's administration, which is really a large-scale retreat from this idea of enforcement-based equity. So you have a qu quote here from Matthew Albans, um, director of one of ICE's divisions, saying, effective immediately, officers will take enforcement action against all removable aliens encountered in the course of their duties. John Kelly, who's now the chief of staff, but <clears throat> for about um, seven months was the head of Department of Home Security, said the laws on the books are pretty straightforward. If you're here illegally, you should leave or you should be deported. So, um, and of course, this is not rhetoric. Uh, as as um, you know, even, even DACA, um, well, perhaps it's some indication of just how sympathetic the recipients of DACA are that the program lasted seven months, but, but um, DACA is now over. Um, and now all deportable non-citizens are more or less equal priorities. So anyone who's deportable is a priority for enforcement. Um, non-citizens uh, who are being arrested and processed um, without any criminal history, um, that, that number is up something like 150% over the um, same time last year. Uh, there's an increased use of home raids. Um, there's a new practice of apprehending victims um, or witnesses or defendants um, directly from courthouses where they are um, engaged in, uh, in court proceedings. Um, there is enforcement going on in hospitals. Folks like Jeanette Vizguera who are showing up for their check-ins um, who, have, who have previously been here under orders of stay because of humanitarian reasons are, are now being detained. Um, even persons who have lawful paths to status if they're also deportable, so there's a sort of discretionary choice there, um, are, are, uh, have been, agents have been told not to exercise favorable discretion in those cases. Um, there, we're, there already is uh, some uptick in the use of summary removal procedures, and there's um, likely to be quite a lot more use of that in um, the, the near future, as well as increases in detention right now. The agencies are actively scouting locations outside of many multi um, metropolitan areas and also urban area, I mean rural areas around the country to increase detention space for non-citizens. So I think we'll, we'll see a lot more use of detention. Um, one of the ways that this goal of mass deportation um, uh, is, is uh, uh, being attempted to be achieved is through the assistance of local um, law enforcement. So um, this was uh, this was something that really uh, a machinery that really did go into effect under Obama's administration, which is cooperative arrangements um, with local law enforcement. In some cases, actually deputizing local law enforcement um, to make immigration detentions, um, and also the a heavy use of something called the the immigration detainer or immigration hold. So. Um, when a person is arrested um, anywhere in, in any jurisdiction in the country, their fingerprints are, are sent to the FBI to check for outstanding warrants, and then pursuant to an interagency protocol, those fingerprints automatically get forwarded um, to the Department of Home Security, 
where they're they can send, they send up a red flag if it looks like the person might be deportable, either because of an immigration violation um, or a criminal offense or something like that. Um, and, and at that point, ICE then can ask the local authority to hold the person for them so they can come pick them up. And they do that with this thing called an ICE detainer. Um, and the ICE detainer uh, is something that is the subject of a great deal of litigation because it, it asks the local authority to hold the person for at least 48 hours after they would have been released already. Um, and um, it's, I think it's pretty clear that that violates the Fourth Amendment. Most courts, if not all courts, have held that that violates it if there's not additional probable cause to hold the person. Um, the, the simple fact that they might be um, deportable for a civil immigration violation does not warrant their um, detention on that basis alone. Many jurisdictions are willingly complying, in fact, enthusiastically complying um, with the federal government's request for assistance in, in executing this mass enforcement scheme. But not all. And that brings us finally um, back to the story where I began. So um, in the face of this mass enforcement crackdown, we have um, a, a widely proliferating rise of, of so-called sanctuaries. So we have um, lots of different kinds of sanctuaries, but the main ones here are, are on the slide. Um, cities are the ones that I think most people are aware of. So in more than 300 jurisdictions, possibly much more than that now because they're really growing every week. Um, there are policies that could be called sanctuary policies, even if that's not what the agency itself or government calls them. Um, in general, these do a combination of, of three things. They um, limit the information that is provided to federal immigration authorities, either because they limit the information that the local officers will actually obtain, or they just prohibit those local officers from sharing that from information that they do learn with the federal government. They also limit um, immigration authorities' access. So they might say, you know, you can't come into our jails to conduct immigration enforcement um, activities. Uh, and then they also limit the comp compliance with those detainers that I just mentioned. So they, they you know, in, in, in many or in maybe all cases, won't hold a person solely for the purpose of ICE's ability to come pick them up. Um, other, th other things that cit cities do um, sometimes, um, maybe in three or four places so far, is provide legal counsel to people who are facing um, uh, deportation proceedings. And I'm going to talk more about how important that is in a minute. Now we also have church sanctuaries. There is a, something called the New Sanctuary Movement, which is now, um, according to the movement itself, o over a thousand congregations and synagogues and mosques throughout the country who um, provide a, ver a variety of services. It's not the same everywhere. Some, the most extreme thing that they might do is provide actual refuge from removal, as in Jeanette's case. Um, but they also provide know your rights trainings, they provide legal screenings, and sometimes they also provide legal representation for persons who are facing removal proceedings. And then there are campus sanctuaries. Um, something like 77, maybe a few more, um, have policies, again, that they either call themselves sanctuary or maybe they don't, but the policies that they have are like sanctuary policies. So these are, these are policies to not share information with the government about students who are undocumented um, on their, in their student body, um, and who, or to limit the access of uh, immigration enforcers seeking to enforce immigration law on the campus itself. So each of these kinds of sanctuaries has its own independent legal challenges and, and legal justifications. Um, I'm not going to get into those uh, because I want to shift now to, to what my main argument about them is, but they're, I'll acknowledge that they're contestable and messy, but most likely um, they are valid enough that they're going to weather legal challenges in the long run. So I think sanctuaries are, are not going to be stamped out through the executive's um, attempts to stamp them out. Now, how do these sanctuaries fit in to what immigration law looks like now? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I argue that they have very uh, important legitimizing dynamics in this system. So the first one uh, I want to elaborate on is, is what I call the normative grand jury. 
Um, this is an equitable first level screen that sanctuaries can provide in the immigration system. So as I've um, indicated, the federal system really does rely on local criminal justice actors to identify undesirable, so-called undesirable non-citizens, persons who are, um, sh you know, show propensity for disordered behavior, dangerousness, transgressive behavior, and they do that through the proxies of arrest and conviction. So if you're arrested or if you're convicted of something, that's used as a marker that you are a, um, uh, a less desirable uh, member of our society. Now, because the Trump administration has its goal of mass and indiscriminate deportation without any equitable consideration, um, removal measures are going to follow once a person, uh, once a non-citizen has been turned over to federal authorities. So the argument here is that local officials function something like an equitable grand jury, refusing to indict that person, except where there are aggravating factors. So most of these cooperation limiting policies um, have either explicit or de facto exceptions um, where they, uh, the, the so-called sanctuary jurisdiction will in fact turn a person over to ICE um, if they have a serious criminal record. Now, the other, the other legitimizing dynamic is um, through, is by providing uh, um, counsel. Um, there is study after study showing how important attorneys are to achieving accurate results, not just normatively accurate, but legally accurate results in the removal system. So when cities or churches provide legal counsel, they are contributing to actually um, to procedural fairness and also legal, legally accurate results. It's, it's three to five times more likely that you'll win your case if you have representation um, than if you are um, pro se. And the numbers go way up if you are um, not detained and have representation. Uh, the council can help make sure the government meets its burden of proof. They can contest the accuracy of the charges. They make sure people show up for court, they can secure release from detention, and they can uh, help prove that you are eligible for some kind of discretionary relief, if possible. And finally, um, sanctuaries can act as what I call a last resort circuit breaker. So this is when all formal processes have now been expired, but there are still compelling legal or equitable uh, reasons that a person might be justified in, in remaining inside the United States. And the opening story that I began with Jeanette Vizguera's case, I think illustrates that, where um, this, is, this is a woman who had um, a very, in fact, it, it illustrates two parts of what I've what I claimed here. She actually had a legal way to stay in the United States through the U visa, um, but she also had very compelling humanitarian factors. And so when she went into sanctuary, it allowed it, it, it stopped the machinery for long enough for negotiations to continue. Eventually, ICE capitulated and, and let her um, remain in the country until her U visa is adjudicated. So um, to sum up, I think a, a system with consequences for human life that are as significant as banishment and the destruction of the family unit requires enough play in the joints to account for individual cases. Um, the responsibility for equitable sorting has moved forward in the process, away from adjudicators at the back end and towards enforcers. But when enforcers fail to undertake that responsibility and instead seek mass and indiscriminate um, enforcement, this locus of discretion shifts even further forward to the police, to the prosecutors, and to other sub-federal sub actors in the non-citizens community who are going to exercise equitable discretion. Thank you. Okay, we are very lucky to have our next uh, speaker. Lakshmi Chala is the managing attorney of Chala Law Group, and she also serves as the senior counsel in LeClaire Ryan's Richmond office. She has practiced immigration law for over 20 years, representing a variety of clients, including corporations, athletes, universities, entrepreneurs, and renowned chefs. 
For nearly a decade, she acted as special counsel on immigration for the uh, Virginia Office of the Attorney General. And she was invited uh, by the U.S. Department of Commerce to present immigration options to Department of State officers. Ms. Charles served on former President Obama's White House Roundtable for Innovation and Immigration. She is also deeply invested in her community and has been awarded many honors as a result of her service, including the YWCA 2016 Outstanding Women, uh, Woman in Business Award, the Virginia Lawyers Weekly Influential Women of uh, Virginia Honoree, the Henrico County Community Leader of the Year, and Women Who Lean In Award at the Live to Lead Conference. I also want to say on a personal note that it is an honor and a joy to work for Lakshmi. She goes above and beyond her duties as an employer. She is fully committed to the people who work for her and does everything that she can to uh, mentor us, to inspire us, and to just generally help us become the best legal professionals that we can be. So with that, it is an honor to introduce Lakshmi Chala. I want to thank the um, Public Law Review Symposium for inviting me to this today, and I want to thank uh, that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you at Chella Law. You, you add that youthful excitement that we, I personally, so lacking, you know, so that's it's fantastic to have you there. Um, one of the things I wanted to say before I go into my presentation about, it's, it's about that sanctuary cities, what they were talking about earlier. I thought that was fascinating and great, but and especially now because we're seeing all these ridiculous ads of um, how they have M15 and how sanctuary cities uh, will keep, M you know, it, it'll bring M15 into your neighborhoods because the whole idea, and I, I don't even like the term sanctuary city because it's not really a sanctuary. Um, sanctuary, you think of uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, where he goes up and he says, sanctuary, sanctuary, and you know, he's given refuge. If you're a criminal, and if you're M15, and you're found to have committed a crime, what they are already doing when they, you know, when you are arrested, is uh, the fingerprints are being shared with ICE. The difference in implementing uh, what is known as 287G, 287G is a memorandum where um, the ICE gets into a relationship with local law enforcement. Now about, I think about 13 or 14 years ago, we were, Virginia was thinking about doing this and I was appointed to be on Senator Stolle's uh, Illegal Immigration Task Force, or Criminal Immigration Task Force. And um, if you look at an article that two UNC students wrote about how the economic effects are of the so-called sanctuary cities. Um, it's really detriment to, I mean, forget about the racial profiling, which, you know, and what I had pointed out is I remember in the uh, meeting, Delegate Albo at the time said, oh, it's not a big deal, I'm, because it's not criminal aliens, they will, they, under 287G, they can ask the immigration status of anyone that's committed a traffic infraction or supposed traffic infraction. So anytime you're stopped by the police for speeding or maybe, uh, you know, a rolling stop or what have you, the police can look at you and say, can you show me your immigration documents? Now, what I had told Senator Albo is they're not going to ask Senator Albo. They're not going to ask anyone that looks like you. But they're going to stop me, and that's okay, because I'm an attorney and I know that I can say I'm a U.S. citizen and they can't uh, say anything beyond that. But what if they stop my mom? What if they stop a 16-year-old kid? And is that the kind of society we want to live in, where we now are allowing, you know, uh, U.S. citizens to be stopped because of the way they look? And in uh, North Carolina, what had happened was the immigrant community became so scared to come out that, you know, remember that they are a consumer. So they stopped going to grocery stores because they stopped going to church because the policemen would actually target the um, churches by, you know, 
the Latino community. And um, as a result, it hurt their economy tremendously. So I encourage you, it's UNC, uh, it's, called, it's UNC, it's the economic uh, aspect of 287G. Take a look at that article, it was fantastic. And it doesn't, that doesn't even go to about community policing, right? So if the police, if people are scared that the police are gonna ask them about their immigration status, um, they won't, they'll be less likely to report crimes that are against them, they will less likely to cooperate with the police uh, to go after the real criminals. So please look at that article. Sorry, I had to make that plug. Okay, so I'm talking about the economic impact of immigration. You know, when you think of immigration, everyone's thinking of, do I do this? Is this it? The right button? Okay. Am I not pointing? Right? I'm, I'm technologically challenged. Oh, it's you! Hi. It's me, hello. He was a DJ at my daughter's wedding. It's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. So see. just press that really hard. Okay. And he knows how technolo technologically challenged I am. Um, but uh, when we talk, nowadays when you hear about immigration, you hear about walls, you hear about travel bans, you hear about terrorists. Um, there is fear and um, uh, this whole idea of uh, trying to, you know, restrict immigration. Immigration is very critical for economic development. And we are at a approximate 3% GDP growth and everyone seems to think everything's hunky-dory and why do we need economic development? Well, we have a ridiculous trillion something, 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 something. I can't even, I don't even know what that number looks like, debt. Um, we have an aging population. So labor is gonna be a big issue. And in the background for looming is the, the concern about inflation. So if we don't increase our uh, GDP, uh, there's going to be all sorts of problems down the road. Now there's this committee for responsible federal for a responsible federal budget. They are a fiscally conservative committee, right? And so the committee said the three things that are needed to ramp up our economic growth are um, innovation in terms of manufacturing for efficient and effective technologies and so forth that help us produce more and in a more fit, efficient manner. They said capital investment is really critical. The U.S. is currently uh, the largest uh, recipient of foreign direct investment. But there are a lot of countries that are barking at the bit to get a piece of our action. And uh, for, you know, companies are not going to be really excited about investing in a uh, country where you're uncertain that your key employees cannot come here to oversee that investment. And they said three, but they said this is the greatest impact was immigration. And immigration touches on all those things because immigration not only increases your labor force, but it also is the key uh, spark for innovation. Uh, there, and I'll, that's the focus of what I'm, I'm going to be talking about. So I'm hoping by the end of this, in my 30 minutes or so, that, I can, uh, that you will at least think, when you think about economic development, you'll think about innovation, you'll think about investment, you'll think about uh, uh, immigration. And when you think of immigration, you won't think of walls. You'll think of bridges to opportunity. You won't think of fear. You will think of resources and invaluable talent. So with that, let's get started. There we go. Yeah, that's what I did. I did that. Is it not working? Let me see. Are my fingers too fat? No, no, no. It's actually not working. Just say next slide and I'll. Okay, I'll... next slide. Thank you. So it's investment, immigration. Next slide, please. And innovation, international talent. There we go. One more. Okay. Um, in today's climate, you know, the, the biggest challenge is, especially with business schools and so forth, you know, the idea of startups is so different than it was in the past. You know, it's new applications, it is in um, robotics and manufacturing, it's in artificial intelligence or Internet of Things. And 
you know, we want those uh, folks to come to the United States, and you want that to be launched here. Um, and the reason is the U.S. is still the platform for a global marketplace. But we're making it very, very difficult. Um, and so higher education actually is a great economic booster for us when you have foreign nationals coming to school. Next slide, please. Um, you can see here that the international uh, students contribute so much in revenue. And, you know, I spoke last year to about 42 business schools across the United States, including Yale, Cornell, uh, Stanford, UT Austin, and um, University of Illinois, Champaign. And University of Illinois said, because if they didn't have their international students, they would not um, be able to continue to sustain themselves. They pay out-of-state tuition. They buy, you know, produce. They're consumers. And then if they stay in the community, they really become uh, a big asset. So, for example, Ohio has come up with a great program. Um, and it's, it's trying to attract a lot of international students to their locality. And uh, because they find that they're great economic drivers. Um, not only in terms of the revenue they bring as students, but, you know, labor force. You get a talented labor force. If a company like Facebook is coming here, one of the things they're going to look for is, do we have access to a, a talented labor force? Um, the other thing is that um, they often start businesses and so forth. So they add to the community. And one great ex example of that, if you all are familiar with the Shamin Group, the Shamin Group, um, they, he started out as an engineer in Richmond. Um, they bought a, their first hotel. They now have 50. They're one of the largest employers in our area. And they're responsible for all the, in, you know, all, all the construction that's going on downtown. They uh, remodeled two hotels. They're, do, they're bringing Moxie, which is a very high-end uh, European a hotel to Richmond. There are only one of th there are only three moxies that are opening in the United States, and one of them is going to be in Richmond. And in a 300-mile radius, there's not going to be another moxie. And uh, you know, distillery, restaurants. So it's not only the the number of people they employ, but the number of jobs they create indirectly. Um, another example is we had a panel a panelists the other day came here as a student. Um, he now travels to over 22 countries, helping them with their, uh, you know, their energy needs, you know, reducing emissions, trying to make their energy plants more efficient in terms of coal and gas. Uh, and he, he was saying that coal, can, you know, cannot be, we cannot sustain the power that we need without coal. So what he's able to do is he's come up with a product, he has eight patents, where um, he can get more energy out of using half the amount of coal, thereby reducing the emissions. And he gets, every time he comes into the United States, he gets stopped by immigration asking about, oh, what are you doing representing the United States in energy? You know, and he says, well, I'm the expert, you know, and he's a permanent resident now, but it's ridiculous what kind of scrutiny he has to go through. There are 22 other countries that would love to have him. But he chose to stay here. And um, I, I think it's phenomenal that whole pool of uh, talented resources we get uh, when, when they come here for further studies and what that can do in terms of the economy. Next slide. So 20 out of the $87 billion um, in startups, you know, we're responsible for that amount. And it, we have made it very difficult for startups to uh, stay in this country, and I'm going to talk about some of the regulations that uh, were here before that are going through some problems in terms of this area. So startups were responsible for all the net growth in the United States. The other thing is, uh, do you know how many major metros grew without immigrants? Any have, anybody have an idea if there's any metro in the United States that grew without immigrants? The number of that is zero. So. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring out is this idea of nativism, the, the we only want certain type of people in the United States is not new. 
Um, the very first uh, Naturalization Act of 1790 said uh, the only people that could naturalize were white people, free white people that have resided here for two years and that were of good moral character. And then uh, in 1924, an even more draconian Naturalization Act was passed where no Asians were allowed. Uh, Eastern Europeans were capped. And of course, Western Europeans, everybody, there was no cap, there was no limitation. And that's very Brexit-like. You know, the Brexit people, Bannon, everyone's kind of uh, a certain type of uh, European, not all Europeans, but certain type of Europeans, that prefer preferential status has always been there. And I always laugh because, you know, we are a country of immigrants. With each immigrant community coming in, once you're in, you're like, okay, I'm in. I don't want the next folks coming in. So uh, the Italian immigrants, the Irish immigrants, the German immigrants, what, what, what we were hearing uh, about the uh, South American or the Latino immigrant community now, that's what they were saying before. They don't speak English. You know, they don't, they have a different culture. Um, they they uh, talk differently. They, you know, we're going to be absorbed by them and we're no longer going to retain any of our originality. And in fact, they, they said, uh, in fact, Jefferson said this. Uh, he was concerned that Germans, they would Germanize us instead of becoming Angloized, is what Jefferson had concerns about. So here we are. We have Oktoberfest going on. We celebrate St. Patty's Day. And um, Italian food is almost a staple of our American cuisine, right? So America didn't become diluted with all of this. Instead, those cultures have woven in to the American fabric and have made us more enriched and fortified. And I think if we just remember that, I think we will remember what is so great about the country. So next slide, please. Okay, so India and um, Virginia, and I found this very, I was shocked to find this out. Virginia is um, one of the top uh, foreign born population in the US. And about 67,000 of them are self employed. And look at all the jobs they create. 168,000 Virginians are employed by immigrant owned firms. And I work very closely with uh, Virginia Economic Development Authority. Um, the state's Department of Trade and Commerce, and even with the Richmond Greater Richmond Partnership. And they have told me that 80% of their investment into Virginia is foreign direct investment. So it's really critical for our um, economy. And in fact, Virginia's uh, new American Fortune 500 firms employ 475,000 uh, people globally. and. Uh, of the Fortune 500 companies in general, 42% uh, of them were founded by immigrants or children of immigrants. And the interesting thing is, I'm an, I, I, uh, my, my grandfather came here in the 1940s, my dad came here, and my grandfather went back to work for the United Nations. My dad came here in the early 60s. He impregnated my mother before he came over here. So I came over after some time with my mother, with uh, Chapel Hill as my Plymouth Rock. And um, I'm also senior counsel at LeClaire Ryan. So Gary LeClaire is a son of a dreamer. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting how, you know, and Gary, um, I certainly have, uh, have not done as much as he's, he's done, and I, I don't think I could. He's pretty remarkable, but um, he started a two-person law firm close to 30 years ago. They now employ 600 people in over 26 odd states. So um, that, it, there's something about that uh, idea, because when you come here and your parents come here, it's not an easy process. You know, it's, it's very difficult. So you are all about the American dream, and that this is the place I can make it happen. And maybe that in your blood and seeing what your parents struggled with helps propel you into trying to make sure you do the very best with the opportunities you're given. You know, sometimes when you've lived with that all your life, you don't realize how great the country is. And then when somebody else comes in and sees, sees all of what we have, 
um, they want to make sure that they, they utilize the resources. So visa options for um, students. One thing that people don't realize is, you know, the process for immigration to the United States, they think is fairly easy. The way you would think about it, you know, about the extreme vetting process and like we're handing out green cards to everybody that's uh, coming down the road, the permanent residence cards. That's not how it works. So um, a vast majority of our master's degree programs in STEM um, have international students. And um, in fact, um, the, when, they come, when you come in as a student, you have to have the intent to return home. So, you know, the school gives you an I-20 uh, for admission where they confirm that you meet the eligibility of admission. You also have the financial wherewithal to take care of your uh, tuition and stay and so forth. And then they issue this document that's called an I-20 and they send it to the foreign student that's overseas. The foreign student then has to go to the consulate, which is run by the Department of State. So you have the Department of State taking care of all the consular um, provisions all over the world, issuing visas. You have the Department of Homeland Security here in the U.S. that's dealing with anyone under the jurisdiction of the United States, which would be U.S. companies and individuals, foreign nationals that are residing in the United States. And then in some instances, you have to deal with the Department of Labor. So um, since there is no, since the university does not have to file any petition with the Department of Homeland Security, they don't have to, you know, they're not subject to that. So they just have to send the documents to the foreign national overseas who goes to process the visa. When they go to process the visa, they have to establish that they need to return to their home country. And some of the things they look for to establish they need to return to their home country is, you know, property, bank statements, and so forth. And if you think about it, it's only, you know, that, that whole idea, and then when they come here, we're trying to figure out ways in which to keep them here. You know, the, uh, it's such a contradiction in terms of policy among the three agencies that are working on it. And the other thing is, it's incredibly limiting to, you know, a really smart person who may not be very rich. You know, and, um, you know, they may not have their own house, but they're taking out a loan or what have you to send their child here. Um, and it becomes uh, very difficult. They get three minutes. And the consular officers, I was, uh, I was honored to be able to, I presented with them at a uh, Department of Commerce event last year, because I, I got to uh, share the stage with uh, all the council generals in India, and they said, well, we don't look at the documents. I'm like, damn, we spent so much time preparing those documents. Uh, but they said, you know, we, it just depends on, you know, how, what the person says and, you know, if they can answer our questions right. And I'm sitting there thinking, it's scary. Um, it takes hours to get, and sometimes it's, it takes so long to get an appointment, you have to go for hours. And, you know, partly the consular generals are very nice. They're just incredibly overworked. And so they're not in the best state. So it's unfortunate that that's what they have. So as, as an F1 student, you can't work outside of campus. You can um, work only in school uh, for 20 hours a week. It's limited. And um, you can work like in the library. I, I, I actually attended the University of uh, Richmond as an F1 student. Um, and at that time, there weren't too many at the University of Richmond. And I used to work in the library, and I'd do research for uh, J.P. Jones, uh, but I was limited to 20 hours a week. I became a permanent resident by the time I graduated. Uh, it was a lot easier back then. But uh, after you finish your course of study, you're eligible for OPT. The only way you can work outside the university, I mean, outside your academic institution while you're in school is if they have something called CPT. CPT is curricula practical training, which means it has to be incorporated into curriculum. Like, let's say you're an MBA. You know, a lot of MBAs, they have to have some um, work-related uh, matters. So um, they, uh, they're permitted to work outside with permission from the designated school official that is overseeing all the international students. And, um, you know, after you complete your status, I mean, after you complete your uh, education, you're allowed to file for optional practical training, which allows you to work in the United States for one year, right? 
If you're a STEM graduate, you can file for, you can have an, uh, you know, up to three years if you meet certain requirements of optional practical training. So there you are, you're graduating, you've got one year, what are your options afterwards? Well, everybody knows, uh, has heard about the H-1Bs. Um, H-1B is usually the, you know, best use of, you know, an immigration uh, vehicle to get work authorized in the United States. There's only uh, 85,000 H-1Bs that are allotted per year. The quota opens up in the uh, USCIS fiscal year is from October, and you're allowed to file six months in advance, so April 1st, April Fool's Day is the day, is the first day you can file. So last year for 85,000 slots, there were 266,000 applications. And they are not reviewed merit-based. They are reviewed through a lottery. So, you know, if you're that student, especially a non-STEM student where you don't have three years to get a couple of bites of the apple, um, it really becomes problematic in terms of finding what's your next path. That's why these business schools are trying to find um, innovative ways to work on that. And we're doing a couple of things with universities where we're trying to leverage entrepreneur hubs and we're trying to do one uh, for the city of Richmond as well. But, you know, some of the things that uh, we've told universities is just don't look at straightforward um, H-1B. Try to make sure whether your students uh, are eligible for other things. So O is an individual with extraordinary ability. And um, they have to meet certain criteria and, you know, they can get a work authorized status in the U.S. We did a really cool one for um, someone out of uh, the University of Virginia. This gentleman, uh, he produces buffalo free mozzarella from Colombia. He, when he went to visit his home country, Colombia, he saw all these water buffalo there. And they were just used to haul stuff. And he goes, you know, we got a lot of green here. So he went to Italy, learned how to um, make buffalo mozzarella, and everyone kept telling him, including the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture, that there's no way you can do it in Colombia. They don't have, you know, the sophisticated equipment. They're used to milking cows manually, and, you know, you have to bring it from there to here. There's so much you would have to do, but he was able to do it. And if you go into Whole Foods and any other place and you see Buff Creamery, you will see that that is a product of an O1. And then he went on to um, do coca. Uh, using coca to make chocolate. And so his uh, product has now won international awards in chocolate. And the amazing thing is, he went and he retrained the indigenous community, the communities that are forgotten in Colombia, to make these products. And he had them shipped to the United States on the back of uh, flowers were being shipped to the U.S. from Colombia already. So there's no you know, carbon footprint for his product coming into the U.S. market. And it was pretty extraordinary. So, you know, O1 is an option for some people. E2, that's a strange beast. Okay, so there are about 22 odd countries. It's a treaty-based visa. So there are about 22 odd countries that have treaties with the United States, including um, Iran. Um, but these are all old treaties. There's no new treaties that have come in. So the emerging markets where you want to really have that relationship, uh, bilateral relationship in terms of investment and trade, we don't have them. But if you are of one of those 22 countries, then you know, e, there's E-Trade and there's also E-Investor. E-Investor is a good mechanism to boost your startup in the US. Um, there is no specific amount that you have to invest in, in an E. They just have a substantiality test. So the substantiality test means that whatever the amount of the investment is, the uh, investor, E-Investor, that's a national from that country, has to establish a substantial amount. So if you're talking about 10 million, then you know the amount will be less. But if you're talking about a $200,000 overall investment because it's a service oriented, you want to see a substantial part of that 200,000 in the investment. The other test they have is a marginality test. So the marginality test says that the E investor has to uh, create jobs for more than himself and his family. But he's got a five year period to do this. So a solid business plan in place that shows that he will be able to hire more people uh, will allow him you know, the ability to boost his startup in the US. Um, there's also a permanent residence process uh, that's called the EB-5 program. It's called EB-5 because EB stands for Employment Based 
permanent residence, and it's a fifth preference. Um, EB-5 program allows you to invest 500,000 or 1 million and create 10 U.S. jobs. What's the difference between 500,000 and 1 million? Well, it depends on the geographic location. If you want to invest in a, you know, a, a rural area or an area where there is high unemployment, then you're allowed to do so because they want to, they want to um, entice you to invest in those areas to boost the growth. Um, if you want to, if your investment is going to be in a major city like Loudoun County, you've got to invest a million dollars. And either way, you've got to create 10 jobs. But there are two types of EB-5 projects, and these projects are either uh, regional centers or they're individual investments. So if I'm a person, if I'm a foreign national and I want to build a hotel here, um, then I can do it myself. Hotel will clearly get the jobs that I need, and you, know, you, you can leverage your investors depending on what type of hotel it is and how many employees you're going to have. There are also things called regional centers where they have specific projects. And these regional centers have to first get certified by the USCIS. They have to get uh, a, an, an economist to use you know, the various styles of you know, uh, how this project will, will create employment. So they're ab able to leverage indirect employment, the construction workers, the plumbers, everybody else. And it has been one of the, um, it's been a very popular program. There's a lot of fraud in it, but I think if we use it correctly, it will be, um, it, there's a lot of things that can be leveraged by that. So these are the limited things that, uh, that people who want to start a business in the U.S. can use, as, as opposed to France and Canada and other countries where they have provisions for startup. Chile has a program where uh, they invite people from all over the world and they provide housing for the one who wins the investment. They provide, um, you know, startup money. So. Everyone else realizes how important enticing those global entrepreneurs is. Um, the two things I'm going to leave with, I'm going to talk about DACA a little bit, and then I want to talk about some uh, new regulations that are currently looming. So DACA is a program, um, it was, it was uh, a program that allowed uh, students through executive order because we couldn't get the DREAMer Act done. Um, and not everyone was eligible for DACA. You would have had to arrive here before you were 16. Uh, you would have had to arrive before June 15, 2007. Uh, un yeah, would, you would have had to have been under 30. And if you had committed certain you know, crimes and so forth, you're not eligible. You'd have to have been in school. So there's certain criteria for it. But it allowed those uh, dreamers, if you will, to uh, apply for work authorization and have a deferred status. So deferred doesn't mean that they are in any way excused. It doesn't give them any status in the U.S. It doesn't give them any, but it just says, you know, in the priority of deportation, we're going to put you in the back of the line so you can feel a little safe. And um, I've got the stats up there about DACA, but I want to tell you some, after uh, the election last year, I had, there were groups around the Commonwealth that asked me to go out and speak to their DACA students. And uh, when I would go out to speak to them, you know, these are people that don't have, their, their parents don't have the uh, college plan, you know, where they have money to go to school. So DACA allowed them to do, you know, to go to school through in-state tuition. Before then, Virginia was like a don't ask, don't tell. So University of Virginia, if you were uh, here undocumented, would not allow you to go to school. Uh, Virginia Tech is not going to ask you. VCU is not going to ask you. So admission was different, but you'd have to pay out-of-state tuition. So DACA allowed them to go to school with in-state tuition, and many of them have two jobs. I've met young, one young man, big smile on his face. He's doing architectural diagrams during the day. He's cleaning, he's, he's cleaning uh, office space at night as a janitor, and um, he's going to school full time. And when, when uh, Attorney General Sessions said, these kids are taking jobs, I'm like, my son would never do that. You know, and you know, it's, it's to see that excitement and, and for that child to be the first person in their, in their family to ever go to college, it's fantastic. And you just think about what the reverse of that would be. What are we going to do with these kids? What, you know, it, it's, you know, this is wonderful because 90% of them are in the workforce. And um, they are creating taxes and jobs. And I mean, uh, and it's just, it would be lost revenue. There is a tremendous fear, even though the uh, government has assured everyone that they're not going to go after the DACA recipients, they're scared. Their parents are scared. And um, 
it is really, it is really um, unfortunate, but I, I do believe that the Fox, uh, Fox poll, and I, I use Fox because we can see what the context is, it said 80% of Americans are supporting some sort of pathway for dreamers. So um, let's hope that, you know, there's 30,000 DACA eligible people here, 21,000 did not, they were what, and I've got to do this quickly, what the president did, what President Trump did was he uh, is trying to rescind DACA. So those people who uh, were going to expire before March of next year, March 5th, they had to apply for an extension by October 5th of this year. And I think about 21,000 of them could not do it. And so, um, you know, I think it's, it's unfortunate, but in the Commonwealth, DACA, recipi I mean, DACA recipients had paid 30, I mean, 70 million in taxes. So lastly, I know I've got no time, I just want to go through some changes that are taking place um, within immigration. Number one, you know about, um, there was an entrepreneur rule that came out, it was also executive order. It was supposed to roll out early June. Uh, President Trump uh, rescinded that. I mean, he said, we'll wait and see till May, till March. And the entrepreneur rule would have allowed these students that are here in business schools to do a startup. There's certain requirements that they would have had to have met, but it was something that everyone was supportive of. And um, they weren't given a status, they were given parole, because through executive order, you can't give a status. Only Congress can do that. So they gave a parole. Uh, a venture, National Venture Capital uh, Association and three startups filed suit uh, against the uh, stop of the executive order and then they asked for uh, an enjoyment and said, you know, they didn't go through notice and comment, so the, exec the entrepreneur rule should be allowed to go on until March and uh, they said that, you know, these three companies, uh, you know, there was irreparable harm to them because they had to open up their offices in Canada because they didn't have authorization to stay in the United States. October 20th, they're going to, they're going to have, um, the judge is going to hear um, the case. So the travel ban, uh, you know, earlier this week, or it was late last week, uh, was struck down by Hawaii and Maryland. Uh, they kept in touch Venezuela and North Korea, but they found that the Muslim countries that they targeted, there was not, not enough substantial information to show that they, the entry of those individuals would be detrimental to the United States. Uh, the another rollout was data collection. They can, the government can now get data uh, on social media from not only foreign nationals but, and permanent residents, but naturalized citizens. Um, so anyone who's not born in the United States and anyone who communicates with people who are not. So all of you may now, because you've, taught, you've heard me speak today, may be subject to. But I said the funny thing is, that means the first lady is going to be subject to this. And you expect, if the president is communicating with his wife, that she will be subject. I mean, he will be subject to this. Uh, so it really impacts everyone. And uh, the rates, you know, they're looking to reduce the number of legal immigration to the United States, which everyone has said, you know, would be very uh, detrimental. And uh, they want to bring in a merits-based system, and they keep saying it's akin to uh, Australia and Canada. I want all of you to try to take that test. You know, if I didn't go to law school, I wouldn't, you know, I'm over, if you're over 50, you know, you don't get any points. I mean, it's, I wouldn't be eligible. So, you know, that was horrible. Um, we're also seeing longer processing times, tougher adjudication standards, increased interviews and document requirements, and um, higher rates of RFEs. So, although currently the climate doesn't look good, I feel that there is, you know, it's almost like that disruptive change. So what I'm hoping for is um, enough businesses, I, I can appeal to President Trump, who himself is a businessman, uh, about the benefit. I mean, he is benefiting from immigration. The only pro-benefit, pro-immigration thing that he did this year was increase the H-2Bs. And that's because Mar-a-Lago filed for 79 of those increases. So with that, um, I thank you for the opportunity. I know I went through a vast, complex subject in a very short period of time. And um, if you all have any questions, or if you want any of the materials, you can email info at chalala.com and we'll send you the UNC report or um, any of the other documents that support uh, the economic growth. Thank you very much.
We will now take a brief break. We'll meet back here at 11.15 for our next presentation. So that's a change from your program. Um, we got a late start, so everything's pushed back five minutes. seats and come together. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Michelle Freeman. I'm a manuscripts editor with Peller and um, I have the pleasure of introducing the next speaker. The next speaker, excuse me. Uh, Margaret Hennessy is our next speaker, and she supervises a farm work program for the Legal Aid Justice Center in Charlottesville. She's been with the LAJC since January of this year and has formed a team of lawyers and organizers that visits farm labor camps and other isolated worker communities throughout the state, addressing the legal needs of low-wage immigrant workers. Previously, Margaret litigated farm work disputes in Maryland, Oregon, and Florida, and worked in various legal service organizations on issues affecting foster children, seniors, and sweatshop workers. Please give her a warm welcome to the podium. In case I have a Marco Rubio moment here, I gotta have that next to me. Um, Thank you very much for allowing me to spend some of your time with, here, uh, with you here today. Um, I have to uh, tell you one thing that this is a lesson for you law students here. Um, in the program that you got, it says that I'm a supervising attorney. I am not a Virginia attorney. Um, I practice law in other states, but I have not practiced law in the state of Virginia. And um, it wasn't said in the introduction, but um, as you'll find out, that's a very critical distinction for the state bars that you not practice law in their jurisdictions when you aren't licensed in their jurisdictions. So that was the first um, sort of housekeeping. But um, so I work with the Virginia Justice Project for Farm and Immigrant Workers, which for obvious reasons we call the Farm Worker Program. Um, and I am here speaking about a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of immigration law. Um, I work in a context of lawyers. I work in a law firm called the Legal Aid Justice Center. And we're a legal services program. We do not get legal services funding from the federal government, which is a big advantage when you're trying to work with farm workers, um, many of whom are undocumented. Um, and just sort of briefly, for those of you who don't know, if you get that federal funding, you cannot work with undocumented workers, period, end of story. Um, and as you'll see, the workers that we work with um, are, the, or at least the group that I'm going to be talking about, are not undocumented, but a lot of the people that we work with on other issues um, are. So that's, um, that's another sort of piece of the puzzle. Um, I appreciate being invited, being invited to talk here today, um, and I'm wowed by what I've heard so far in terms of the speakers and um, the knowledge that they presented in a very short period of time um, about immigration law and the options and the problems. Um, the title of my talk today is Challenges of Working with Immigrant Farm Workers in the Time of Trump. Um, obviously, that's a huge subject. Um, I'm going to narrow it down to, or maybe just rename it to Control by Fear. Um, we are in a time where our government believes that the best way to control our immigration, to control our borders, um, and to you know, regulate those aspects of our laws that have always been very complicated and fraught with many different concerns and considerations, um, that the best way to do that now is to make people afraid. Um, and I have to say it is one thing that the administration has succeeded at. Um, when we're out in the farm labor camps, when we're out in the rural communities, when we're out in the immigrant communities, the fear is palpable. 
Um, it's always been there for undocumented workers, but um, as some of the previous speakers have indicated, um, there's been a certain humanity in the way that the laws have been enforced. Um, I practiced immigration law a long time ago when it was the INS that everybody was afraid of instead of ICE. Um, it wasn't a walk in the park then for immigrants either, but at least it wasn't like just this imposition of fear on their world. Um, and that's something that I'm, a reason that I'm happy to be talking to you and for those of you particularly who are law students um, is that I want you to think about practicing immigration law. Um, and of course, I also want you to think about representing farm workers. But um, so, so I'm talking about one piece of that fear here today. Um, and um, it's, it's the guest worker programs. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit more of that, of what that means. You've probably heard some talk about stuff that's in Congress right now that's being presented about how to address issues that employers have with the guest worker programs. Guest worker programs go b way back um, to the Bracero program, which started in World War I. Um, there was a program. and. Then there was a program in World War II. It was bringing in workers. Um, back then, it was the idea that there weren't enough men to do work in the fields. Um, it was a, um, an agreement between the Mexican government and the US government to bring workers in to fill the temporary and seasonal needs um, of employers here in this country. The last Bracero program ended, I think it was 1964. Um, but since 19. 56, I believe, um, there has been a form of guest worker in the immigration statutes. Um, it used to be called H-2, and then in the IRCA in 1987 or 88, in the Immigration Reform and Control Act, they split it into two, the um, H-2A and H-2B, which are basically H-2B is, is non-agricultural workers who are brought in on temporary non-immigrant visas, H-2A, H-2B. The H-2A are the agricultural workers, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on today. Um, they are very similar programs. Um, they are programs that bring workers in for a temporary period of time on these visas to work for one employer. Um, I, I, I want to, because the other speakers have done such a great job of sort of giving you a rundown of some of the laws and issues, as I was sitting there, I, I want to go a different way, um, because I want you to put something in your mind at the beginning of the talk about these guest workers, and that is the definition of human trafficking. Um, it is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, coercion, excuse me, or co coercion, for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. Let me narrow that down because I want you to plant it in your mind as I'm talking. Um, I'm going to narrow that down to obtaining a person for labor through the use of fraud or coercion for the purpose of subjecting that person to involuntary servitude. So I'm sure your brains aren't as shallow as mine. Plant that in there as I'm talking, um, and hopefully when we get to the end, we'll circle back around to why I put that in your minds. Um, so. We have this program, um, the H-2A and H-2B, which I will tell you briefly um, how they work. The employers that have seasonal or temporary labor needs that they can't meet or believe that they can't meet by hiring U.S. workers, um, they have to go to the United States Department of Labor um, and, and essentially establish through various means that there are not enough U.S. workers to pre perform this work, and that the wages that they will pay these workers will not adversely affect the wages of U.S. workers in the same industries in the same areas. Um, it is a somewhat complicated process. Um, they have to advertise with 
local, um, uh, what do they call it, the, the local uh, labor boards, um, uh, labor agencies, they have to advertise the jobs. Um, they have to have certain terms, which includes a certain wage rate. Those wage rates uh, tend to be over the minimum wage that you hear about, the state minimum wage or whatever. Um, I'm not going to go into how those wage rates are established, but basically they are supposed to be based upon surveys of what is the prevailing wage in the local area. Um, it's much more complicated than that, but, but the general idea is that they don't want to be offering wages that will depress the wages of American workers. Um, the idea is also that if there are American workers available, as in U.S. workers that are here working um, legally, they have to hire them first, and they have to find them. Um, so that's sort of the gist of what is required. Um, the, the employers have complaints about it. Needless to say, the advocates have complaints um, for, for quite a number of reasons, um, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, the, the programs have been wrought with difficulties from day one, from back in the time of the Bursero program. Um, and and the, the difficulties are obvious when you are bringing workers in they are promised a lot of things. The, the employers submit what are called job orders or clearance orders. Um, they can be multi, multi-page long things. And what they say is, we have X number of jobs we can't fill by American workers. We want that number of visas for foreign workers to come in. It's usually Mexico, although Jamaica um, and other countries as well, most of them are from Mexico. Um, we have, I think it's about 8,000 H-2As and H-2Bs here in Virginia, but don't quote me on that. Um, we have this work. They have to describe the work. They have to say what wage they're paying. They have to say what period of time they're offering the work for. In the case of the agricultural laborers, the H-2As, they also have to offer free housing. They have to offer, and it has to meet standards. Um, they have to pay for the transportation to and from the home of the worker where the worker is recruited. Um, and they have to put all of this in writing and provide it to the worker. So let me give you sort of the storyline of how that works for a worker. Um, you're in a little town in Mexico and Often it's somebody in your town, sometimes it's a relative or whatever, comes to you and says, you know, you're making 10 bucks a day. If you come up to Virginia, you can make 11 bucks an hour at this job. So you should consider doing that. And the employer is going to offer you all of this. They might get it in writing. They're supposed to get it in writing. Um, and you'll get paid back for the transportation, so even though it's 3,000 miles away, don't worry about it, Marco Rubio. Um, and I'm going to charge you 1,000 bucks for it, but don't worry about it, because you're going to make so much money, and you don't have to pay me back until you get home. Or, I'm going to charge you 1,000 bucks, but I know you don't have any money, so I'll lend you the money. Or, I'll take the title to your house or to your family's house. Um, and you're going to make so much money, don't worry about it. When you get back, that's fine. That's a big problem right there, needless to say. Um, employers are not allowed to charge fees for recruiting their workers, but it happens all the time. Um, and it happens because it happens in a foreign country. We have like virtually no control over that. Um, um, Oftentimes, I'm sure it happens without the knowledge of the employer. Um, oftentimes, it happens with the knowledge of the employer. Oftentimes, it happens by a specific agent of the employer who's being, um, you know, employed to do that. Um, so that's that's one issue. That's the beginning of the issue. So the worker gets on a bus from Mexico, um, is brought to Virginia to a labor camp. Um, I don't know if. 
how many of you are aware of how many labor camps there are in this state, but um, there are hundreds of them. Um, they all have to be certified as meeting the conditions by the um, state health department. Um, and, and the health department has a list of the ones that are licensed. They aren't all licensed either. Um, and the H2Bs, by the way, which I'm not going to talk about very much, who are the non-agricultural workers, um, they don't get free housing, which means we don't know where they are. We don't know where they're living. It's sort of the same process in terms of recruitment and in terms of requirements, um, except the employer is not required to provide housing. Um, and so that creates a problem for people who are trying to connect um, with those workers. But, and those workers, by the way, um, you also might not be aware, are landscapers, housekeepers, sometimes construction workers. Um, it's a whole variety of workers that you might not think we're bringing foreign labor in for, but we are, um, by the thousands. And, um, and they face the same kinds of problems that, um, that the agricultural workers face. Um, the the uh, idea of these guest worker programs, and I say it that way because it's an annoying term for me because we don't treat these people like guests. Um, they are brought in, the, those, these programs are based on the idea that there, that there are employers who have legitimate seasonal and temporary needs for workers. That's what they were based on. That's what they started on. That's sort of been the excuse all the way along of, of why they're necessary. Um, there are proposals in Congress um, to make changes. As you can imagine, there are really two sides <laughs> to, to what people want. Advocates for farm workers and for these other low-wage workers for decades have been trying to get the programs improved. Um, Perhaps one of the biggest problems is that the Department of Labor administers, you know, this whole process, um, and there's very always been very lax enforcement. You know, it depends on who's in political power. It depends on who the local DOL person is. Now, of course, it also depends hugely on budget, um, and it's my understanding for the state of Virginia um, that the Department, U.S. Department of Labor has two Spanish-speaking investigators for the entire state. Um, and they're supposed to investigate the housing of all of these workers, including the H-2Bs. They're supposed to be investigating, um, you know, the health and safety issues of the workers, along with OSHA, of course. Um, they're supposed to be investigating whether workers are getting paid properly, um, so on and so forth. It simply doesn't happen on, on the scale that it needs to happen if we want to, um, if, if we want any integrity in this whole process of bringing in foreign workers um, to work here. Um, you may know that our president um, has H2B workers on his winery out in his vineyards um, in Charlottesville there, um, and of course at Mar-a-Lago down in Florida. Um, and I know that it's, it's still surprising to me um, that, that there's a justification for bringing in workers in a lot of these, um, a lot of these areas, but you know, that's just my personal opinion, which you might find that I have a certain bias here. Um, um, so that's one problem. Another problem is these wage surveys that they use to decide what farm workers should get paid when they're brought in on these visas, or these H-2B workers as well. Um, the surveys around the country are generally very, very outdated. In some cases, they're using ones going back to the 80s. Um, and that's what they're saying, okay, we're not going to adversely affect local workers' wages because this is what the local workers' wages are, and we're going to actually pay more than that. Um, in, in rare circumstances, that may be the case, but generally speaking, and there's all kinds of studies on this, that, um, that they actually do depress the wages of the local workers. Um, and uh, the growers maintain that, and I don't, 
I don't mean to, to put all growers into the same category at all, um, but there are enough around the country, um, and my own personal experiences tell me this, um, that it really taints the whole program. Um, they maintain that this program is just impossible to deal with. One minute. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, I'm going to rush through this a little bit. They maintain that, that the program is impossible to deal with. However, they keep asking for more workers. The number of workers keep going up on these visas. Um, and the proposal in Congress, um, there was a proposal on October 2nd that Representative Goodlatte put out. Um, and I just want to tell you um, a few of the things that are in that proposal because this might bring it back to um, what I started with, which was the definition of human trafficking. Um, the proposal wanted to expand the program to year-round jobs. So basically, any of these jobs that we can't find American workers for, we want to get these visas to bring workers in to work for me and nobody else. Imagine the implications of that. Let me just ask you a question. How many of you would take a job that you, that you would get a whole list of this is what you're going to get paid, this is how long the work is going to last, these are the conditions, this is what you're offered. And then when you get there, none of that happens. You get paid half what you thought you were going to get paid. The work is 20 hours a week instead of 40 hours a week. The housing sucks. You don't get reimbursed for your transportation like you were told. But that's okay with you? No, of course it's not okay with you. So what do you do? You try to enforce that. You try to enforce the fact that I have a contract with this employer. Wrong O. Um, in the H2B context, in particular, the courts have been terrible. They've said, nope, that's not a contract between the worker and the employer. Who enforces it? In Goodlatte's bill, nobody enforces it except the worker and the employer together. You have to go to mediation. You have to go to arbitration. Guess what, worker who just came here and didn't get paid? You have to pay for half of that mediation and arbitration. And guess what else? There's not going to be an attorney that's going to help you with it because A, there's no attorney's fees provided, which means private attorneys aren't going to take it, and B, the legal services attorneys that otherwise would want to help you can't help you because we have put restrictions on them so that they cannot represent you in these cases. That's already true for H-2A workers. It's not true for H-2B workers. Um, and you are working for this employer no, ma no matter how abusive the employer is to you. That's your employer. You can't go to another employer. How many of you would take a job like that? These are desperate people coming from desperate economic circumstances in their home countries and they are our guest workers. Um, I would venture to say that I wouldn't consider them guest workers. As guests, of course, they have absolutely no right to immigrate legally. Um, the employer who brings them in and doesn't follow the rules, doesn't provide them what they said they would provide, says to this worker, you better not complain, because if you complain, I'm firing you, which makes you an illegal alien. Because when you lose that job that that visa is attached to, you are an undocumented alien in our country. Doesn't sound like a guest to me, or the way you'd treat a guest. Um, so let me, because time is short, um, let me just swing back to trafficking. Um, I think that this Goodlatte bill is really a proposal, and it has been yanked, by the way, but it wasn't yanked because advocates, farm worker advocates, were against it. It was yanked because, A, there's a whole group of people, as you know, who just don't want any foreigners in our country, um, and B, the growers had some problems with various things, which I don't have time to go into. But um, remember that trafficking is obtaining a person for labor through the use of fraud, as in making promises you don't comply with, or coercion, for the purpose of subjecting that person to involuntary servitude. I want to quit your job. Fine, you quit my job, and ICE is coming after you. So um, I have some resources which, can I just say them, they'll just take two seconds, that you might want to look at. 
Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center has an article by Mary Bauer, who's my director. Um, it's called Close to Slavery, and you can find that on their website. It'll tell you a lot about, uh, about these uh, guest worker programs. And uh, a group called Centro de los Derechos del Migrante um, has an article called The Hidden Picked Apart, The Hidden Struggles of Migrant Worker Women in Maryland. And that's at C-D-M-I-G-R-A-N-T-E dot org. Sorry to rush through it, but thank you for listening. Good morning. My name is Brittany Barnett. I'm a second year law student and staff member of the Public Interest Law Review. It's my honor to introduce our next speaker, Madeline Taylor Diaz. Ms. Taylor Diaz received her law degree from the Catholic University of America Columbus School of Law and her Bachelor of Arts from the George Washington University of Latin American Studies. Ms. Taylor Diaz is an immigrant staff, sorry, an immigration staff attorney at IUTA, a nonprofit organization that provides direct legal, social, and language access services to low-income immigrants in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. She has extensive experience working with immigrant children and families in their immigration cases. Ms. Taylor Diaz began at IUTA as an Equal Justice Works Fellow, sponsored by Greenberg Traurig LLP, providing legal services to immigrant children. She's also served as the Interim Managing Attorney of the Virginia Office of IUTA. She currently serves on the Supervised Visitation Advisory Board for Fairfax County. In July of this year, Ms. Taylor Diaz published a practice advisory regarding the impact of the Virginia Court of Appeals decision in Canales v. Torres, um, the impact that this case will have on advocates' ability to obtain predicate orders in Virginia's juvenile and domestic relations courts and circuit courts. The case is currently being appealed by the Legal Aid Justice Center. Please join me in welcoming Madeline Taylor Diaz. everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you for the introduction, Brittany. Like the speaker before me, I'm talking about just a very small piece of immigration law, um, but a piece that has been very professionally important to me and is also very important to the children um, who the law protects. And I've been told I have 20 minutes to do it, so I'm going to get on with it. Um, oh, here we are. So special and juvenile status, and the acronym that I'm going to use throughout is SIJS, is a federal immigration law that was created to protect a certain class of particularly vulnerable children. That class of children being children for whom reunification with one or both of their parents is not viable due to abuse, abandonment, or neglect. So this class of immigrant children, um, Congress carved out a special protection for them in the form of special immigrant juvenile status. What makes it unique, and why I like talking about it um, to Virginia lawyers, is that it requires a unique um, interplay and access both to federal immigration systems as well as state courts, and in, in our case, um, the courts in Virginia, namely the Juvenile and Domestic Relations District Court, as well as the circuit courts and the courts um, beyond that. It was created in 1990 and then expanded in a way that would allow it to protect more children in 2008. And it is a path to permanent residency, which I know is sort of a concept that's been in the news recently. So up here on this slide are the five requirements for SIJS. And as I mentioned, there's a unique interplay between the state courts and the federal courts. And this list of five, oops, I didn't move on. Well, OK, there we are. This list of five requirements is what a state court would have to find in order for a child, an immigrant child, to be eligible for this federal protection. So um, I won't read them out to you, but the most important, the sort of factual underpinnings of a special immigrant juvenile status case are the bottom two, that for the child, reunification with one or both of their parents must not be viable due to abuse, abandonment, neglect, or a similar basis under state law. And then the second sort of factual underpinning is that it has to it has to be in the child's best interest to remain in the United States with their parent or the caregiver instead of returning to their home country. So those two factual requirements would be requi it would be required that a state court, again in Virginia, the JNDR courts, 
would make that finding in order to establish the child's eligibility for SIJS. Now, we refer to the order that a child would have to obtain or, or the caregiver would have to obtain on behalf of that child as the predicate order because they have to have that in order to proceed with the federal authorities in order to obtain special immigrant juvenile status. However, as I'm sure many of us know, there's nothing in Virginia law called special immigrant juvenile status. So one of the requirements on the page before is that the child has to be validly within the jurisdiction of the court. So there has to be some jurisdictional under pinning in the Virginia courts that would allow the child to have access um, to, a to, the, to the state judge in order to obtain the order that would establish their eligibility for SIJS. So most commonly that would be a custody case or any other proceeding um, validly before the courts, a delinquency case, a CHINS case, um, foster care proceedings, etc. And so once a child was already in the, in the jurisdiction of a state court, they would seek those factual findings in order to proceed with an application for special immigrant juvenile status with the federal authorities. And that predicate order would obtain the facts that make them eligible for that status. Oops, am I moving too fast? No. Okay. So what I'd like to talk about is a precedential decision that um, happened, came down recently in Virginia that has affected the way in which these special immigrant juvenile status cases are adjudicated in Virginia. And we're lucky to have one of the attorneys um, here that argued the case before the Virginia Court of Appeals and continues to be working on it, as was mentioned by Brittany in my introduction. Um, in June of 2017, the Virginia Court of Appeals made this precedential decision that has caused a bit of chaos and confusion about what Virginia courts are supposed to do with these cases and what their authority is to enter, to enter and make those factual findings about the child's eligibility for special or juvenile status. So again, those two factual findings regarding abuse, abandonment, or neglect and their best interests. So there were three major findings um, in the Canales decision that I'm going to talk about in turn. So the first one is that the juvenile and domestic relations district courts and the circuit courts in Virginia aren't authorized to make SIJS findings as an independent matter. And for practitioners that were doing this case, that didn't come as a surprise. We all knew, we read the Virginia Code, that there is nothing in Virginia Code that says um, special immigrant juvenile status. It's not an independent um, petition that you can file for in state courts. There's no independent authority in the state of Virginia to seek special immigrant juvenile status. So this didn't affect the status quo, and again, it didn't come as a surprise. There are states, and um, including one of our uh, neighbors in Maryland, that do have this as an independent, um, an independent case type, but in Virginia, that doesn't exist. So again, it didn't come as a surprise. The second finding, again, didn't affect status quo, was that while the juvenile and domestic relations district courts and circuit courts aren't required to make these findings of facts, that they may make these findings of fact um, when it's in the course of their regular business. And again, this wasn't a surprise. Practitioners who had been doing SIJS cases in the past um, were familiar with this concept, that they didn't just show up at the Juvenile Domestic Relations District Court and say, I'd like special or juvenile status, that it had to be validly predicated upon some other case that was within the jurisdiction of these courts. So this didn't come as a surprise. What did come as a surprise, which I'm sure I'm not hiding the lead there, was the third finding. If this okay. The third finding was, and I quoted some of the language up there, that the a Virginia court has no authority to answer the specific question of that last factual finding that I put on the slide up previously, that it would not be in the child's best interest not to return to their home country. So essentially, um, what the court said was that we're comfortable making the other findings in fact, but this last one that attorneys are asking for on behalf of these children, that it's not in their best interest to remain with their parent in Virginia instead of returning, or their caregiver in Virginia instead of returning to their home country, that the courts didn't feel comfortable um, making that finding a fact. 
Now, it came as a bit of surprise to many of the attorneys doing this case that both finding, of, um, the, both the finding number two of the Virginia court, the Court of Appeals, and finding number three could coexist. Because while the Court of Appeals said, sure, sometimes um, kids might be able to get these orders in our court, they also said, but hold up, that last finding of fact, I'm not sure that we're able to do that. So it's, it's somewhat unclear how these two um, findings of fact, how these two findings of the court can exist at the same time, and hence the confusion by the state courts since that time. So, and what advocates have responded to that last finding of of, um, of the Virginia Court of Appeals was that the is that there is ample authority in the Virginia Code which would allow a judge sitting in a custody case in the Juvenile Domestic Relations District Court or on the, in the Circuit Court um, that would allow a judge to make almost any finding that was relevant to the best interests of the child. And where that authority comes from is um, principally two places, as well as some jurisprudence and case law. First of all, that the Virginia Code grants judges in J and DR courts a broad amount of discretion and authority to act in the furtherance of the best interests of the child. In creating the J and DR courts, um, the code states that they should be able to act in the furtherance, both in law and equity, of the child's best interest, because that's the entire purpose of their existence, to ensure the best interest of the child and to make sure that the orders of the court are furthering those interests. And second of all, the Virginia Code provides a long list of factors, known as the best interest factors, that should be considered in any case regarding the custody of a child, um, and that those factors are delineated specifically to address the needs of the child and also include a catch-all provision. So the factors that are considered in any custody case include um, things we might all imagine. The parent's past relationship with the child, um, their willingness to continue on in a relationship, the particular needs of the child, etc. And then a last factor, which is a catch-all provision, which is anything that is anything that is necessary or proper for the court to consider in making a determination about the best interest of the child. So what advocates have said in response to this third finding, which um, some judges see to, to, as limiting their ability to make the special and juvenile status findings, is that they do continue to have the authority to do so because the code has given them broad um, power to make decisions in furtherance of the best interest of the child. And the code specifically gives us a list of things to consider, including anything that is necessary or proper and relates to the best interest of the child. And so given that broad authority and the fact that um, the Court of Appeals decision cannot and does not strip the court of the, that authority, that they should continue to be able to, to enter, these, um, enter these factual findings on behalf of this this um, protected class. Now, on the ground, there's been some confusion. Um, I practice in Northern Virginia, and so I'm most familiar with the sort of the five Northern Virginia counties that are happening there, but judges are confused as to what to do with this decision. Because while it, while it simultaneously says that they can make these findings of facts, it also sheds some amount of doubt on their ability to do so regarding the best interest of the child. Um, so I think that there's, there's, it's still in flux a great deal as to, as to what Virginia, how everything's gonna play out. And the Canales decision, which had these three, um, three findings is on, is on appeal in the Supreme Court of Virginia, being handled by Legal Aid Justice Center. So hopefully we'll, there'll be some clarity coming up soon. But thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, thank you for, for being here today. Thank you very much to the, uh, uh, to the review for putting on this program. Uh, I know uh, you've all enjoyed some very uh, poignant and personal stories that you've heard throughout the morning. You've heard some excellent uh, content from Ms. Diaz. Thank you for helping us qualify for CLE credit. Very, very well done. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I know many of you are appreciative not only of the content, but the fact that we are able to, to uh, 
enjoy having CLE today, which is uh, important as we are en ending the month of uh, October soon. Uh, a little change of pace now. Uh, we are going to do a panel uh, discussion uh, which will be a little bit more free-ranging and non-topic specific. And uh, we have four excellent um, panelists here. And I'll let them t tell you a little bit about their own personal details. And you'll see their bios are really nicely laid out in the terrific uh, materials that the uh, review has, has put together. Um, but the way I'm going to introduce them uh, is to tell you a little bit about how they are very illustrative of how immigration law brings people together from different perspectives, diverse angles, and, uh, and, and really different policy views and, and different lives. Uh, let me start by telling you a little bit about myself, uh, since I'll be uh, moderating today. My name is Bill Benos. I'm a partner at Williams Mullen. I founded our immigration practice uh, 25 years ago, and it was founded on the basis of a very interesting case. As, uh, uh, as the Soviet Union collapsed, I had the opportunity to represent a very prominent communist in Gorbachev's cabinet. And the memo went around, and, and one of the partners said, we need someone to help handle this case. Anyone have any interest? I was a uh, fifth year associate, I guess, at that time. Of course, I raised my hand, and that's what brought me into this, uh, into this area of practice, ultimately. Um, now, my focus at Williams Mullen as a, as a practitioner in a large firm is primarily business immigration law. So as I was telling Corey, I try to avoid immigration court like the plague. I don't, I don't make any, uh, we have, I have a partner who, who handles those things. But it's also good to have partners and, and a support team to help handle things in this particular area. So I came to immigration from the perspective of a business perspective, and that's what I'm going to speak a little bit about today in terms of my perspective. These four uh, ladies have a much different perspective in many ways. Uh, Tanishka Cruz. Uh, is a uh, solo practitioner at Cruz Law in Charlottesville, and she's an attorney also with the Legal Aid Justice Center. So her perspective is, is interesting because she comes from the opposite end of the law firm size perspective from me, and she also blends family law with immigration law, which is, it, it, which is a nice and, and different perspective from mine. And she also brings a pro bono perspective, which I think all four of us share, because my pro bono focuses primarily on uh, asylum cases. Uh, I have Corey Alonzo Yoder, and um, she's a practitioner in residence, and she sort of brings the perspective of academia. Uh, she's with the Immigrant Justice Clinic at American University. American University Washington College of Law. Noreen Heider is here as well, and she also brings a slightly different perspective because I guess I bring the old person's perspective. She, like the rest of the panel, brings the young person, dynamic person's perspective, and she's the founder of Heider Immigration Law. Uh, in addition to being a solo practitioner, she shows that immigration is also genetic in her pedigree because when I started practice, I practiced in the same community as her father, who was a fantastic uh, immigration practitioner. So the, the apple does not fall far from the tree. So. <laughs> and lastly, we have Ashley Shapiro. And uh, she's an immigration resource attorney for the Virginia Indigent Defense Commission. And so she brings the perspective of, of an educational component in the criminal law uh, context. She does public defender training. Uh, and primarily that relates to the consequences of criminal convictions, which can be pretty serious and devastating to a lot of individuals who often don't really know what, what also comes of it. So those are the directions that, that, that we're going to bring. And uh, I'm going to go through and ask them to talk a little bit about some hot button issues that they see in their practice. But before doing so, let me let each of them say hello to you and we'll start with you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, can you all hear me all right? I have a red light on my microphone, but it seems to be working. 
Um, so I'm Coriolan Soyoder. I'm a practitioner in residence at American University Washington College of Law. I'm a clinical professor in the Immigrant Justice Clinic, and our work revolves around uh, a broad base of, of justice, equal justice issues that uh, arise for immigrants in the DC community writ large, DC, Maryland, and Virginia, but also transnationally. Um, I wanted to um, thank Ms. Hennessy for her reference to Centro de los Derechos del Migrante's Picked Apart report. That was actually a um, collaboration of our clinical program with CDM, which is an organization on which I sit on the board. So I'm glad to see that that's still getting uh, around. Our work um, involves individual client direct representation as well as project-based policy advocacy work, including the, the kind of work that was related to our Picked Apart program. We're currently um, involved in a legislative advocacy effort in Maryland related to that work, related to the crabbing industry, to create stronger protections for recruiters who go into Mexico to recruit for the crabbing industry. So that's just a, a little bit of a we take a, diff a somewhat different approach to clinical um, teaching, and we work on a broader base of, of issues than just immigration specifically. Um, so that's a little bit of a, a background on, on me and on the clinic. Tanishka Cruz, and um, I actually came to Virginia back in 2012. And <clears throat> in 2014, I learned that the Legal Aid Justice Center was starting up a special immigrant juvenile project. Um, it was birthed out of the crisis where we had numbers of unaccompanied minor children arriving at the U.S. border, which since 2014, there have been over 150,000 unaccompanied minors from Central America. Um, you know, I started in as a volunteer attorney on that project and then weaseled my way into a full-time staff position um, where I led the um, Special Immigrant Juvenile Project with them working statewide, on taking these cases and training pro bono attorneys that we needed in the communities to, as uh, Ms. Diaz talked about, got, getting these predicate orders from, from juvenile courts throughout the state of Virginia. Um, and as time went on, um, you know, I've shifted roles at LAJC. I am now um, co-teaching and co-supervising the Immigration Law Clinic, uh, which is run in conjunction with the University of Virginia. And we basically do a lot of asylum cases in that clinic. Um, and now in private practice also in Charlottesville because I saw a big need in the community. Um, you know, working for Legal Aid Justice Center has been so fulfilling. <laughs> Um, but it was also, whenever you work for a pro bono organization or free um, legal services, there are priorities. And you can't take every case that comes in. Um, and it was very difficult in Central Virginia, you know, especially in the Charlottesville area, not having very many attorneys, private attorneys, to refer people to. So that's why I opened up my own shop. And that's what excellent, doing. excellent. Noreen? I'm Noreen Heider. Um, as Professor Baino said, I am the founder of Heider Immigration Law here in Richmond. We are a full-service immigration law firm, so we kind of touch on a lot of what you guys heard about today, a little bit of SIJS, a little bit of business immigration, family immigration, removal proceedings. So we do a little bit of everything. Um, I've been practicing immigration law for a little bit of time, um, but I started my own practice two years ago. So we've slowly expanded and grown, and we're uh, just hired a new attorney and um, we have a good staff, so um, we really are helping a lot of immigrants in the Richmond area. Um, it was really exciting to hear. A student of mine, by the way. Yes, I hired an attorney who was a student of his. Um, but it was great to hear that Tanishka is starting her own practice because it's wonderful to have good resources um, in the Virginia area. Um, and as you said, Charlottesville was sort of a small community of immigration attorneys. So um, I kind of bring a different perspective to this panel in the sense that I haven't had any nonprofit uh, background. Uh, my passion for immigration law kind of was running around the halls of my father's immigration law firm. Um, from a very young age, so I never thought that I would actually end up doing that area of law, but um, when I graduated I realized that I kind of associated practicing law with helping people, and I guess I only really associated it with immigration law. So I landed, um, after commercial real estate, I landed in immigration, and I haven't stopped since, and it's a really great area to be a part of. My friends uh, that are a lot of attorneys know that I'm very, very passionate about what I do, and it's kind of something that to, to be proud of, that 
um, being an attorney in this area, in this era of um, you know the administration and all the changes that we're going through, we really are helping people on a on a daily basis. So that's me in a nutshell. Excellent. Uh, my name is Ashley Shapiro, and I actually come from the complete opposite side. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I've been a criminal defense attorney um, for about six years prior to starting my current job. I was up in Northern Virginia, where there's a very high non-citizen population, and I saw my clients who were already sort of the forgotten of society, the indigent clients, people that were even worse off than most of my clients were non-citizens, that were also indigent and also couldn't afford an attorney. And in Fairfax, in my particular jurisdiction, we didn't exactly have favorable prosecutors and judges to work with. Uh, so I worked with another great organization in D.C. called the Capital Area Immigrant Rights Coalition. They sort of partnered with our office to offer us training. I was particularly interested in it. And then uh, after Padilla, actually, my agency decided to have a Padilla compliance attorney, which are popping up all over the country. Uh, Maryland has a very established um, attorney up there, so I took the job to combine the two interests. And now I'm not in court anymore, but I'm training all of our public defenders across the state and developing curriculum for all the court-appointed attorneys to make sure they're um, coming up to their Padilla obligations. There's a lot of pushback about that in the criminal bar. They think that they're too busy, they don't have time, and it's my job to tell them I don't care. Um, so I do a lot of trainings. I also do case-specific consultations. So after the trainings, attorneys will reach out to me and say, I have a client with these issues, with these charges, what can we do? And that's everything from trying to get different charges, trying to amend indictments, particular sentences, or in this era with undocumented clients, a lot of times just fully advising them to understand what's going to happen once they get to immigration court, how quickly that's going to happen. Uh, we're also working on dealing with detainers, which are under Obama have been being used unlawfully less and less. Uh, the Attorney General had an opinion, I think in 2015, saying that you could not hold someone after their criminal release date, which is what all of the courts have held, it's the Constitution. Um, that's starting to go by the wayside with increased pressure from ICE, so we're kind of tracking that and trying to challenge that and keep an eye out for how the local government is responding in the new era to ICE demands. Excellent, thank you. Uh, what I think you'll hear uh, as we sort of relate some of our experiences today is that there are, we all share some commonalities, and maybe a lot of you do too. And, and I made a small list before coming. I, I thought, well, we're deadline driven. I think we live and die by deadlines, and that is the nature of immigration law. Uh, it's a granular practice. Uh, Litigators may have large cases. They might have um, a, a large tort action which consumes days and weeks and, and months. Uh, we have little bits of sand on the, on the beach of hundreds and hundreds of cases and it, it, for most of us. And that adds a different uh, stress to our day. It adds a different dynamic, uh, but it adds a, a certain uh, um, excitement as well. Um, the reason why I decided that I thought it was an area that I wanted to go into rather than just a, a basic corporate setting is that it's, it's also a very personal, uh, personal practice. I think you'll hear today experiences uh, that, that, that reflect that as well. And by luck or happenstance, uh, the one thing I think we all share is that uh, immigration law is also at the intersection of really important issues in our in our society. Um, social issues, public policy, government, the rule of law uh, for, for many, uh, business, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a, key, a key blend that, that defines us. So with that little background, let me ask my first question, and we'll start, since we started here and you had the lo longest time to prepare, uh, uh, my first question is, um, what is the biggest challenge you face on a daily basis practicing immigration law or being in the immigration field in, in, in your chosen uh, profession? Sure. I think the biggest challenge um, and has become an increasing challenge is the extremely discretionary nature of the, the law, of immigration law and the decisions that are made. Um, between individual judges or adjudicators who are making determinations on uh, relief for, from deportation or eligibility for benefits to officers who are um, on behalf of, of ICE enforcing the law and who are they going to be targeting their efforts towards. It makes it difficult to understand um, when counseling individuals 
who are going to be um, most at risk. And this ends up being a risk assessment when you're dealing with millions of people um, in the U.S. who are living in the United States undocumented. But even those who are in lawful status and are looking to change their status or are looking to um, remain in the country and, and move into a different um, form of protection under the law, because there's such a highly discretionary um, system and, and the nature of the decisions can at times uh, be difficult to challenge, especially if there's determinations made about an individual adjudicator's assessment of credibility. It can be very difficult to um, later appeal or to uh, in any way challenge that, that determination later, which makes it quite difficult to, even within a, a set system of laws that's quite elaborate, to let individuals know what they can expect. And it becomes a very kind of personalized to your jurisdiction, sort of understanding who are your adjudicators, who are your judges. But you'll see um, nationwide there's wide fluctuations, especially in the immigration courts, over the kinds of decisions that are made, what kinds of claims for asylum particularly are granted. And that makes it quite difficult to give a sense of certainty when you're advising. And we never talk in terms of absolutes, but definitely when an individual is coming and is trying to get a sense of what their options are, it can be quite difficult when there's such a, a wide range of possible outcomes or determinations. Particularly for people who, um, in my practice, I've, I've worked in the last several years with asylum seekers who are seeking protection based on their sexual orientation or uh, transgender identity and they don't believe that there will be uh, any sort of government protection from them from the beginning. So kind of helping them to understand that process for asylum can be uh, quite daunting and, and they may decide they want to remain in the shadows then take the chance that they might be denied an op opportunity to be safe. So I think um, that for me is difficult and I think when we're working uh, in the clinic with students, we have 16 students in the Immigrant Justice Clinic and we're trying to help them understand. Um, one of the tasks and the goals of the clinic is to help students deal with uncertainty because that's what we do as lawyers. And they're not used to doing that, especially not in um, law school education where there are certain right answers and wrong answers <laughs> at times. But um, helping them to embrace uncertainty and to navigate through uncertainty can be even more challenging when the system itself is, is so uncertain and, and increasingly so with executive orders and different priority policy shifts, especially when you're looking at cases that are in a backlog that were filed years and years ago under a certain set of circumstances and expectations about what the outcome would look like by the time it came up for adjudication and recognizing that that is totally out the window. It can be difficult to um, have any sense of stability or, or finality uh, about these decisions. And it may be a several years process before, I mean it will be several years before an individual finds themselves actually fully outside of the scope of immigration jurisdiction by becoming a U.S. citizen. So every time they go down that next step of the path, they're confronting that uncertainty again and again. So I think that that's the shifting sands are probably the, the biggest challenge that we encounter in our practice. Shifting sands, that's, that, that is that's certainly true, and as uh, if you haven't experienced it yet, you will. I know your father experienced it. Um, I have clients who started the green card process in 2004, 2003. It's now 2017. They're still waiting. They're accused, the backlog. So in, addi in addition to shifting sands, I also question the sanity of a system that works this way. And mm -hmm. In fairness and full disclosure, I, I'm also Canadian, so I started practicing in Canada, so I've had a taste of what the Canadian immigration system is. And that in 2014 became uh, an element of discussion in the immigration reform context uh, with the use of and modification of things like points-based systems, uh, different approaches, um, but we'll leave that discussion. Tanishka, how about you? What, uh, what do you face every day? I see the word R, or the letters RFE, and some other <laughs> notes. And, uh, uh, you know, when I got offered the job at LAJC, one of the things the director told me was, every day is going to be different. And I was like, yeah, okay, sure. But, I mean, it really is. Every day is different. Because of this shifting sands idea, um, when you have, let's say, a child that starts off at, you know, 15, 16, and then has a three-year <coughs> wait until, a three or four-year wait before they have a green card interview, there can be so many changes. 
and just things that happen that can just change the, the course of a case. But I think one of the things that I struggle the most with and you know what I have a problem with is it's to me the hardest thing is not the person who has this hyper complicated case that's going to take hours and hours of legal research to figure out. Um, it's the case where I have nothing. There's just no path. Um, and that, to me, is probably one of the most difficult aspects of it because you have very narrow avenues that you can go through. I mean, when we're talking about the 150,000 unaccompanied minor children who have come in and we look at SIJS, that's only a, you know, a very narrow path to relief against deportation because all of those children are likely in deportation or in active proceedings and they aren't afforded the right to an attorney so they have to somehow get themselves represented um, and you have people who will tell you stories about how they've been here for 20 years and you know they haven't broken any crime you know they haven't broken the law they're, they're not yeah you know, but they have not there's nothing because you either have to have a way by way of a family relationship or employment or some humanitarian basis to to find yourself in some you know in the position where you can seek that discretion um, and that's difficult I think that's a really um, challenging aspect of this practice yeah it is a challenge when you have nothing to offer to a client and no matter how creative you've been trained to be it's 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 often uh, a challenge to look them in the face and say I'm sorry, you'll have to wait for immigration reform. I've, had, I've been saying that now for years. <laughs> uh, we had 80, 86, I remember. We had uh, 96. Uh, we were supposed to have 2006, 2007. Nothing happened, so it gets a little bit worn. And, and you see people, for example, they have relatives who are in seriously bad health abroad, and they're stuck here. Um, DACA people. Uh, we've had several who can't go back to visit uh, an, a an aging and dying grandparent in Sicily in one case. Yeah, and there's the myth of, well, now my child is 21 and can they petition for me? And then we talk, you know, I think it was the professor that may have brought up the unlawful presence bars and, and things that happen that are obstacles. Or if you have a sibling, it's still, you're still, depending on the country, you're still looking at 20 years in some cases before you can actually um, get somewhere with your case. And so. I think that's like the most common misconception um, that there is a line to get in. Like, why can't they just get in line like my ancestors did? Or why can't they just, you know, stand in line like the rest of us did? But there is no line. Um, the options for legal immigration to the United States are so incredibly limited that. The, that is a, a big reason why we have so many undocumented individuals in this country because there aren't that many options to get here legally. Um, I think it was Lakshmi that spoke about having to, when you go to apply for a visa at the consulate, you have to show ties to your home country. So property ownership, bank accounts, job. Well, if you don't have money, you don't have those things. So we're kind of limiting the access to come into this country already at the outset for even a visitor visa to only those who have the money to sort of get those um, visas. So um, yeah, that is definitely a struggle in the job. I've been doing it, unfortunately, for, for long enough that I'm a little jaded. So um, we, like, I, you know, out of the 12 consultations we have a day, probably half of them are, we can't do anything for you. But I don't speak Spanish fluently, so I'll have one of my paralegals sit in and interpret with me. Um, and when she first started, after, because we do free initial consultations for this sole purpose, because there's so many people that come in that we can't help. Um, but I would like to tell them what the options could be and why they don't qualify for them so that when they go to the guy down the street or the other attorney that's just starting, they don't waste their money on something that's not available. But my paralegal, after every single one of those appointments, you know, looks at me and says, there's really nothing? Like, there's nothing you can think of? And that's just unfortunately the reality of it. But for me, the biggest struggle I would say is the changing, constant changing uh, nature since, especially in this administration. Um, I was on the phone with a client the other day. He called like five times. And so finally I said, okay, I'm gonna stop my appointments. I'm gonna call him back. And he was terrified because his mother is a permanent resident from Yemen and she was traveling home. And he said something, and this was on Friday at four o'clock. Um, I hadn't looked at my phone. I had appointments. I hadn't looked at the internet. I hadn't looked at Twitter. Um, and he said, something's happened today and I wanna know if she can travel. 
so nothing's happened. I don't know. I've been working. And one of my paralegals runs in with her phone and she's like, something happened. I just got an alert. So literally, that's how quickly things are changing in the sense that with one executive order or one policy shift or one speech by um, somebody in the administration, you know, saying that we're doing something wrong or that we're dirty immigration attorneys, which I promise we are very clean individuals up here. Um, but there's, it's just constantly changing in that um, is Corey said, you know, we are attorneys that are supposed to help our clients deal with uncertainty. But unfortunately, we ourselves are dealing with uncertainty every day. So it's really challenging to be able to give advice that somebody can rely on when we don't know how strong that advice will hold up in the next 12 hours, not even 24 or 48. So that for me has been a really emotional struggle. And, you know, people always ask me, you know, how's, how's practice? And I feel like I'm always Debbie Downer saying, you know, I'm exhausted, I'm tired. But it's just, unfortunately, the reality of it. You guys have gone through many administrations. So I've only had the, you know, I've only been practicing with one administration. So for us younger practitioners, I think it's a new, a new era to sort of navigate the waters. Long answer, sorry. Challenges for you. Um, practicing in criminal court has been particularly difficult. When I first started, it's, you know, all of us are thinking about how tr bad Trump is, but people tend to forget Obama was called the deporter in chief. So when I first started criminal law, I would have clients all the time on driving without a license, a tiny, tiny traffic offense, where I would have to say, sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, if you come back to court, you're getting deported. And of course, they came back every single time because they wanted to follow the law so badly and they wanted to do the right thing. They don't want to not come to court. So they would come to court, they would get arrested, and they would, I would never hear from them again. Then you, we saw sort of the bright light with the enforcement priorities, and all of a sudden, there was ways to protect undocumented clients. And it was wonderful. If I could just get it within this little rubric, I could actually help a client who was undocumented, who's been here 20 years and done everything right, had a little bit of skirmishes with the law, but nothing too serious cut to now where we're back in the place where there's nothing I can do to help this person. And they'll say, but it's just a this. And we're not talking, if someone's convicted of a very serious felony, of course there are going to be consequences for that. But the vast majority of my clients were people with histories in this country, people who have just made some stupid, either young mistakes or just bad decisions or have substance abuse issues. And we would have to either run the balance of don't come back to court, which of course we can't legally advise, or this is what's going to happen to you. And oh, by the way, that one possession of marijuana is gonna trigger mandatory detention. And oh, by the way, I know you have me as an attorney now, you don't get one in immigration court. And I'm all you have. So there's an added uh, pressure that the vast majority of people don't have attorneys in immigration court. I have to train all my field attorneys to give them the only advice they're probably going to have on, hey, apply for cancellation of removal to a person who probably doesn't have a ton of education who's going to have to argue that by themselves in immigration court if they understood it from what I told my attorney to tell them. So it's very frustrating for to just not be, feel so helpless that there's just so little we can do. I mean, I think that we've sort of elevated the criminal practice in the state, but there's still so little that we can do to really help people and we're completely at the whims of prosecutors and judges. So as best that we can do to, we know what the consequences are going to be. I've had it go both ways. I've asked a court specifically for a 364 day sentence to preserve an asylum claim for my client. And she was not known for her, um, we'll say lack of prejudice. And she intentionally gave me 365 days. And I've had that happen. I've also had a judge intentionally give my client a bit extra active time to avoid that 365-day sentence. Same court, same bench, different judges, same charge. And one person has no path to relief, and one person has all of the availability. And having those struggles and sort of not being able to have the control over the situation, aside from kind of holding their hand and kind of helping, is very frustrating. It is frustrating, and what I'm hearing is shifting sands, um, lack of options. But I always pride myself on seeing the glass half full. And so there are gems that come up that, that are illustrative of, of how you can help uh, your clients. Uh, for example, it hasn't happened often, but um, a couple of years ago a case came in and it, it was under the long forgotten almost uh, 245i 
Does everyone know what 245i is? Uh, 245i was a, a provision that sunset in 2000. Uh, it was a provision that had come up that basically allowed people here who were here uh, unlawfully to pay a fee of a thousand dollars and regularize their status. And so uh, you practice, you have some cases up, uh, you know, in the, in the early 2000s, uh, you help them. And then this one came along and we're now basically helping someone uh, who came from Guatemala become a permanent resident who had long overstayed and went through the process, got in line, uh, got in the queue. You're right, there really isn't a line and, and here he is today. And it's coming down now to one finite detail. We have to prove, now think about this, think about what you have in your attics uh, and what paperwork you can, uh, can provide. He has to demonstrate that he was physically present in the United States on December the 21st, 2000. And he has to show by some kind of piece of paper. Um, for us, fortunately, he had kept one stray bank account that showed that he had made a deposit on that date. And at that time, unlike now where we have a proliferation of online banking and you just do everything without ever seeing another human being, you actually had to go to the bank and present yourself to deposit a check. And so that's going to be the saving grace. But in the mode of shifting sands and uncertainty, we're going to have to provide a lot more documentation. Uh, could each of you maybe share one example where there was an option, um, where there was something you could do, and maybe it would illustrate some aspect of the law that would be informative to, to our audience? Um, so I had uh, a positive result just this past week. Um, I met with a client who had been approved for asylum after being in the United States for um, almost 10 years. Um, and if you have any familiarity with asylum law, that's a, a big hurdle to overcome because you're supposed to apply within the first year of, of having arrived to the U.S. So he, uh, applied, he applied rather late and we had to make an argument to justify why that was. Um, and that, those are challenging. The, the presumption is that you're barred if you don't um, meet that one-year filing deadline. Um, and he was a pretty vulnerable individual. He had been persecuted in his home country of El Salvador and um, had experienced severe mental health um, repercussions related to persecution, but also probably some pre-existing genetic conditions, and including hallucinations and feelings of um, that his, one of his family members who had, been, who had been murdered was actually coming to him and telling him to join him in, in death of these sorts of terrifying visions. Um, and, and happily, he was able to get mental health support and his providers uh, were very encouraging of him seeking um, a legal path to see if there was some way that he might be able to remain in the country because they were fearful for his condition if he were to be returned to El Salvador. So uh, we worked on his case. I think it followed me from three different offices um, for about four years. Uh, it got stuck in the backlog and took time to document uh, the justification for the delay in asylum as well as, as the asylum um, merits being met in his, in his claim. And um, happily, we finally got a, a decision that was favorable. And he came into my office this week just to talk through what it meant now to be, have asylum, that he was not yet a U.S. citizen, what were the distinctions, what were the rights and responsibilities. Um, and he just was tearing up. I usually, I mean, we are lucky. We have those opportunities, I think, a lot to, you know, relatively um, commonly, um, maybe drawn out by years, but those, you can have good results for people. and. Um, the tangible benefit of getting some kind of a status as opposed to, um, you know, getting a, a check, I think it makes a big difference in people's lives to actually see that uh, sense of civil, civic inclusion. Um, and he just was welling up with tears and he said, I finally can be part of my country. Uh, he was just never... Uh, never felt that there was anything for him um, back in his country of origin and that he wanted to do everything that he could um, to give back. And he works at a fast food restaurant in D.C. and was talking about how 
even when people accuse him of not speaking English and even when people say things to him about being an immigrant, he forgives them and he's just so happy to have the opportunity to be in the US. So I think that kind of grace and resilience is something that we have the honor of, of seeing play out a lot. And it was, um, for me, I, I usually am pretty stiff upper lip about these things, at least in the moment, but he was making me cheer up as well. <laughs> it, was, it was just a very important moment in his life and, and to be there and to be so um, engaged and um, present and make a difference in that way, I think is incredibly powerful. Cool. Tanishka, how about you? Yeah, I think recently, especially with the new administration and their um, directives, it's become increasingly important, I think, to address the pipeline into the immigration machine. So something as simple as driving without a license in Virginia can lead to very uh, you know, detrimental consequences for folks. So you were talking about, you know, I mean, in Virginia, if you're a non-citizen, you do not have access to a driver's license. Um, and that, you know, you might be on your way to work, you might be dropping your kids off at school, but if you have a burned out tail light and you get pulled over, you're going to get a driving without a license charge. And that in the aggregate, once you start to, you know, rack up more than one, can lead to active incarceration. Um, and although under Obama, you know, you'd go in for the weekend, for your second offense on a driving without a license, you would come out Monday morning and go back to your daily life. But now that's not happening and ICE is there Monday morning to get the person and put them in Farmville or you know one of the other detention facilities. So to me, there are ways of defending these cases. And you know, we talked about briefly like, you know, people showing up, but in some cases they don't. They just want to get rid of the ticket. They just want to pay and walk away from it and be done with it. But there are defenses. And just a few weeks ago, I went into a jurisdiction that's pretty tough. Um, but before the hearing, I had the person do you know, 50 hours of community service in the community. And we walked in with that to ask, you know, because on the ticket it said that it was the fourth offense. I hadn't seen the driving record, but I asked to see it once we got in court. And what I realized was that it wasn't the fourth offense for driving without a license. There were two offenses for driving on a suspended, and there was two offenses. So he was actually going on the second, you know, driving without a license charge. So, you know, I think had he just gone in there and hoped for the best, he would have been incarcerated. Um, because the prosecutor or the Commonwealth's attorney also, although the judge seemed to be leaning towards, yeah, sure, I'm just going to suspend all active incarceration, the Commonwealth attorney stopped and said, you know, judge, like, even though it's only the second one, it's still the fourth. You know, we should, you know, I'm not going to let up on seeking incarceration. But the judge said that this person had done more than most defendants in the situation and done this community service beforehand. So he was going to take that into account. And although there was a sentence, all of it was suspended. Um, so that, to me, you know, stopping somebody from entering that machine is, you know, something that brings me <laughs> a lot of yeah, fulfillment. Absolutely. Some gem on yours? Yeah. Um, I had a client that um, had been here since the early 80s. And as any of the attorneys in the room know that when you have a client that's had more than you know, two or three immigration or attorneys before you, you say, thank you, but you know, no, thank you. I'm not going to help you out. Well, here I was, I had just started my practice, um, barely any phone calls. I was leaving in the middle of the day to go to the gym. So this individual walks in, he says, and a lot of my dad's previous clients will come to me. So he came to me and said, you know, I had a case in the eighties. It was denied. I've had like six attorneys. Um, your father was one of them, but he passed away, unfortunately, you know, before he could come to a resolution, et cetera, et cetera. And I think he got me on the emotional card. So I said, okay, fine, let me review your case. I had time. So I sat down and looked at it. And, you know, at this point, I had just started my practice. I'd been practicing for a little while, but the confidence level wasn't, you know, as high as kind of it is now. So I said, I feel like he has a case. I feel like there's, a, there's an argument I can make here, but how can six attorneys before me not have done it? Well, because they all had probably thriving practices and they didn't have time to sit down on one case where you're getting paid not a lot and spend five or six hours to get to that research. So um, lo and behold, two years later, I argued, won the case and he came in. I mean, he'd been here since the 80s and the entire time he had 
a path and nobody could have, nobody really realized it or argued it because it was a teeny tiny nuance in the law. Um, and he was just so, so happy. He made me cry. He made my reception. I mean, everybody in the office was kind of, and it was really cool for me because I was able to sort of continue something that my father had started and wasn't able to finish it. So that story kind of sticks with me because it was an individual that unfortunately was undocumented in this country for some 30 some years and the entire time he did have a path. So um, there are definitely many positive cases. That come excellent, this. excellent. I think probably my most memorable case happens to be my last case as a trial attorney. And it was, I was supervising one of our junior attorneys on a misdemeanor and it was this kid that we had had in juvenile court, just kind of a troubled kid, but he was nice. He just did stupid young male things. And he, <laughs> thankfully, all of his juvenile offenses were juvenile offenses, so they weren't triggering any grounds of removal. Unfortunately, because of that, he didn't really understand the seriousness of it when he turned 18. And he was a lawful permanent resident. Um, and he had, I think, another offense, and we had him on a crime involving moral turpitude. And this case was very much clearly racial profiling. He was a young black male with a group of young black males. The officer was clearly just targeting them. They had done nothing wrong. And so I got to sort of stand up on my high horse and argue all these wonderful, fun things for a jury. And his family was just devastated that he, who had come here when he was like two, was possibly going to get deported to a country he had never even been to, never even seen. His whole family's here now. Um, and thankfully, the jury found him not guilty. And then afterwards, the family's crying, we're crying, everyone's super happy. Um, and they, he finally figured out how serious all of this was. But we were able to not even get him into the immigration system at all by keeping him, and he truthfully was not guilty, he was just racially profiled, but to be able to protect him from that and knowing the consequences that even if a jury gives him you know, a fine and no jail sentence, he could get deported for it, to be able to protect him from that was just an incredibly rewarding and a pretty good last, last case send off. So there Excellent. are happier moments when you can actually help avoid those consequences. Excellent, so that there is a lesson to be learned, persistence leave no stone unturned, and always take a client who's had six lawyers before you, right? <laughs> um, well, let me turn to my last question. And when I uh, ask you, what do you think of when you think of uh, hot button immigration issues? You, you've seen a lot this morning, uh, kind of workers in, in, uh, in the H, H2 program. Um, uh, you think of sanctuary cities, perhaps. You think of, if you're a parent, uh, why, does, why does someone get in-state tuition when I live here and, and they shouldn't? Uh, Muslim immigration, perhaps, with the executive orders. Uh, a path to citizenship for people who've come here contrary to the rule of law in the eyes of some. Um, uh, prosecutorial discretion and deportation and, and some of the consequences. You might think border wall. Uh, you might think immigration ban, um, and certainly maybe even skilled laborers if you're a business person. It ultimately boils down, however, to one concept, and that is immigration reform, which is something that I think all of us should strive for because it's important. So that's the genesis of my final question to you, uh, which is, uh, what would you most like to see change in our current immigration system? <laughs> Easy question. Um, I told them that these were all going to be softballs. Um, Fix the immigration system. Go. <laughs> I remember it wasn't that long ago that we thought, oh, we could just get the one-year filing deadline for asylum lifted, because that's sort of unique to the U.S. as it relates to refugee law um, worldwide. Um, but now I think um, the priority for me is DACA, um, just seeing that there's a path that's made forward, especially if we're talking in terms of of rule of law and, and who is um, you know following the rules and, and who's sort of it, it's hard because I think it, there's a lot of um, of conflict that I feel about this concept of deserving immigrants and and who those may be, but when it comes to um, people who are kind of most integrated, if that's going to be a goalpost for uh, a, a value that we hold in our immigration system, um, as well as you know just not having an arbitrary enforcement of the law and actually thinking through what's in our economic interest as well as our sort of um, values and principles as a country. I think creating some sort of 
permanent and um, durable solution that includes a path to citizenship for the um, undocumented youth who especially put their faith in the government to handle their information with discretion and handle their, their personal information um, in good faith. Uh, for me, that seems to be the priority at the moment. So follow up, your view would be DACA but not DAPA? Well, you said one, <laughs> but <laughs> DAPA, I mean, I think it's it, a lot of, um, that has seemed to have been the dividing line politically for a lot of people. Um, so to me, I think uh, the, the point is well taken and the, um, the resilience and the courage and just integrity of young people who say we're not leaving our parents behind has been incredibly moving to hear as a, especially as DACA was really um, a creation, not of government, but government under pressure from a, a social justice movement led by individual dreamers who were not going to sit by and, and sort of let their contributions go for naught. Um, I think DAPA is a, a, a logical next step, but I think that it could be, uh, even with DACA, too much of a dividing line for the, um, the populace at, at, at large. Um, however, with DACA having such strong support, I think um, I'm fortunate to not be in the position of those dreamers who have to s leave their parents potentially behind, and I hope that any path forward for them doesn't include some sort of a more punitive effect for their families. But um, getting those folks integrated and established, I think it means it's a matter of time before their, their parents and their other family members follow. Good. I asked that to buy some more time for you, Tanishka, <laughs> since, since this was such a complex thing. What, okay. What's your thought? What's your sort of main focus that you'd like to see changed? So I see a lot of money or talk of money going towards things like enforcement and the building of walls and increase in Customs and Border and detention. And I mean, in the materials, I threw in some statistics about how representation matters. Um, if you are unrepresented and detained, you have about a 3% chance of succeeding. So I mean, I would want to see that people who are detained and facing removal get access to counsel. I mean, that might be really reaching, but I mean, if you leave it up to the legal um, service, the free legal services, there's just no way that these organizations have the capacity to do it all. It's just, I mean, CARE does a wonderful job here in Virginia and the Legal Aid Justice Center and all of these other organizations, but we just can't do it alone. So I think funding that goes towards providing representation, particularly for those who are detained and children, I don't understand how a two-year-old that's in deportation proceedings isn't represented by some sort of counsel, whether that be a guardian ad litem or something. Um, but you can have a baby be before an immigration judge and have no right to counsel. And that to me is shameful. So I would like to see that change. Agreed. I think you would ag agree that the flip side to due process is adequate representation. So uh, absent that, uh, uh, it's a difficult social issue to overcome and to all the students who are here it should motivate you to want to participate in this system because there's a lot a lot of need and a lot that, uh, a lot that can be done uh, what change would you like to see so I think I would agree with Corey um, of course Tanishka 100% I mean the seeing a two-year-old unrepresented it, it, I'm a you know I'm in it I'm a private attorney so I make money off of this but it is heartbreaking to see that there's children out there but um, with general reform kind of being an unrealistic option with where we are um, in our government at this time, I think DACA and some form of providing a path for the young people in our country that were brought here, um, I think is so, so important. So I would sort of um, echo your sentiments on that. And I think that is what is on the table now. And I do think it's a really good step forward. Um, obviously, I would want more, but you can't, you can't get everything, so. Absolutely. I'm going to be exceedingly less realistic. Um, I think the main thing would be to start a line. There should be a line. If you want to come to this country, there should be a line to get in. It shouldn't be that once you're here, you know, you have the person who's like, but I married a U.S. citizen. And you're like, that doesn't really help. So I'm definitely on the pathway path. But my personal interest would be the separation of the immigration and criminal systems. The detention system and the immigration system and the vast consequences for minor offenses in the criminal system has had such disparate and far-reaching consequences and it's 
almost entirely based on ERIRA and the 1996 laws. Um, Expense-wise, it's just incredibly expensive. Violations of due process, just all over the place. Um, they really should be completely separate systems. The immigration system is civil. It's designed to be civil. It doesn't have any of the criminal protections. It doesn't have the right to counsel. They need to be completely separated, or it needs to go the complete opposite direction with right to counsel and all of the rights that are given to criminal defendants, including bond motions, attorneys, those speedy trial. All of those rights inherent in the criminal system either need to be imparted on the immigration system, which definitely won't happen, or it just needs to be completely separated and the consequences need to be not completely taken out, obviously, the very serious offenses. It makes perfect sense to have immigration consequences, but the vast criminalization of the minor offenses, my personal immigration reform would be to separate those systems. Good. As a final word on this topic, um, I would suggest that maybe there's some benefit to looking beyond our borders, looking to examples where this issue has come up elsewhere. Migrant labor is not an American problem, I assure you. I have relatives in Europe, they were hiring their migrant workers, except their uh, Latin America was uh, Russia, Belarus, the Ukraine, Eastern Europe. Uh, migrant flow is, a, is, a, is an issue everywhere. <clears throat> and the issues of, of uh, the conflagrations that come up when ideologies and, and beliefs clash uh, are, are an issue. But uh, I thought it was pretty laudatory in 2014 when immigration reform tried to deal with a balance between border security, <clears throat> excuse me, um, um, empowering the authorities to do what the law said to some extent, but also balancing a more sane system for employment-based or family-based situations, looking maybe to a point system that's used effectively in Canada to, to place people uh, in, in situations. So that, that's something that, that hopefully will come up, uh, hopefully even in this administration. I think uh, crazier things have happened, and I, I'm still hopeful that immigration reform will be uh, uh, something that will, will be um, uh, successful in, in, the, in the next few years. So noting that we're within five minutes, I know that we've met the CLE level because you have to do 50 minutes in an hour in Virginia. <laughs> Um, I will close by opening the, the, the floor to any, any questions that you all may have, um, and then we've got the five minutes. Yes, sir. Great question. With cases taking so long, for those of you who are upstairs, uh, what can a person do or not do? What is the person's status over all that time? Uh, I'll throw it open to, to all of you. I mean, depending on the, the status that they're seeking, they might be eligible for work authorization that's renewable. And with that, you know, in some states like Virginia, you can get a driver's license and that, you know, stabilizes your life uh, some. Um, but again, I worry about the situation where something happens in that time where you're in that gray zone that completely shifts the case. Um, where you can go from losing, you know, losing the employment you know, authorization for something, let's say, as simple as, you know, you have a young person who gets arrested for possession of marijuana. If they're in that SIJ category and they're just in a holding pattern, they can be detained once they're an adult and be subjected to mandatory detention for something very minor. Um, so it's just... Or like Professor Cade was talking about the U visa process and somebody is applying for U visa, but it literally takes four or five years before you get it. Some people get the benefit of getting a work authorization in the middle. A lot of people don't. And so although you have something that is likely to be approved four or five years down the road, it doesn't give you the opportunity to get a social security number, a driver's license, or anything. So it really depends on what you're applying for. And a lot of the things that you're applying for don't get you anything until the final result, the adjudication, which can happen many, many years later. And if you're detained, you remain detained. Those cases are usually put on an expedited docket, but um, someone who is subject to mandatory detention and is seeking to go up the different chains of the appeals process in their case could be detained for years and they're just in immigration detention um, at taxpayer expense. Any other questions? Well, oh, good. Well, hearing that, uh, I guess we are adjourned. Thank you again to the symposium. Well done.
I can just make one quick announcement before we adjourn, um, I just want to say thank you to all the speakers who came here today to share their knowledge with us. A uh, big thank you to Brandon Bowers, our symposium editor, for organizing this amazing symposium. Um, and I just want to point your attention to the insert that was in your program. The Public Interest Law Review published its first issue for the 2017-2018 school year yesterday. Uh, it's the General Assembly edition of um, our volume and it covers issues that went before the general symposium into the 2017 session uh, and talks about proposals for the 2018 session. Uh, our issue for the symposium, which will include a transcript of the symposium, as well as articles written by some of our speakers, will be published in early December. And we're currently accepting articles to publish in our two general topics issues that we'll publish in the spring. So if you're interested in submitting any of your work to us, our email address is pillar at richmond.edu. That's P-I.